My name's Ethan Hale, and this happened to me on February 8, 2015. Not sure how much that matters when facing down things that don't fit on government forms. Regular Joe, you know the type. Wife, kids, a dog too big for the apartment. Bills. The usual. Then there's the other life the job cleaning up messes the news calls, bear attacks, or freak weather. The government calls us consultants. We do the jobs nobody knows exist, hunt the things nobody believes exist. Got sent to Alaska this time. Small town tucked up near the Arctic Circle, some miners gone missing. Locals blamed the weather, which, fair enough, this was Alaska in winter. But when they pulled one of the bodies out of the snow, well, it wasn't frostbite that tore him apart like that. I rolled into town with my partner, Novak. Novak was a mountain of a man, ex-military, the type who could start a fist fight in an empty room. Me? I'm more the careful type. See the patterns, weigh the odds. We made a good team, when we didn't drive each other crazy. Town was spooked. They'd seen things moving in the blizzards, but nobody got a clear look. We figured we had a few days to track whatever it was before fear turned into panic. Best get to work. We started with the body, or what the bears left of it. Novak let out a low whistle. Whatever did this, wasn't natural. Claw marks too big, teeth ragged, like the thing chewed its way through bone. We found more traces along a ridge leading out of town. Thing was big moved on all fours. The prints were wrong. Too wide, too many toes to be a bear, or anything I recognized. Night came fast that far north. Bitter wind whipped snow across the ground like knives. We tracked the prints deeper into the foothills, the flickering beam of my flashlight cutting through the dark. Alaskan wilderness at night? That's some primeval fear crawling down your spine, even when you're armed and trained to fight the things that go bump. Then we found the cave. Novak, ever the subtle one, said, Guessing we're not looking for a bear anymore. The entrance was low, half hidden by drifted snow. Stank of something old, like rot mixed with wet fur. Headlamp on, rifle ready, I went in. It was slick underfoot with half-frozen muck. Old bones littered the floor deer, maybe smaller. The deeper I went, the bigger the bones got, some with marks that made my stomach clench. Human marks. Suddenly, a flicker of movement ahead. It was huge, a dark shape crouched in a wider chamber, back turned to us. The light caught on its fur, thick and matted, dusted with snow. Hold fire, I whispered, even though Novak looked ready to start blasting. It raised its head. In the dim light, I saw eyes gleaming like polished amber. But it wasn't the eyes that stopped me cold, it was the shape of its skull. Long, tapered, the jaw jetting forward in a wicked grin, wolfish, but not quite a wolf. The creature growled a deep rumble. Novak slowly raised his rifle. Don't, I said, keeping my voice low. Might not be hostile. It cocked its head, not in fear, but curiosity. See, predators, they got an instinct for aggression. This thing, it was calculating. You see that hail? Novak muttered, but he lowered his gun a fraction. That is not some lost damn puppy. We backed out of the cave slowly, guns still trained on the darkness. The growls echoed behind us, a warning, maybe, or an invitation. Outside, the wind felt less biting. I looked at Novak. We need to call for Evac, warn the town. He stared back, shook his head. You gonna tell them what? That there's a werewolf out there, or some chupacabra cousin— he was right. Nobody would believe it, 
not until there were more bodies. And the creature. It was smart, strong, and for now, contained. We had the element of surprise. We might get one shot at taking it down before it went for the town. Novak grinned, a feral glint in his eye. So what's the plan, boss? Gonna use that brain of yours and outsmart the monster? That night, we did a supply run in town, playing it off as stocking up on bad coffee and cold weather gear. Nobody looked twice. We got what we needed, traps, bait, plus some heavier firepower stashed under blankets in the back of the truck. We laid our trap back out on the ridge. Use steer carcasses as bait. Lace the meat with sedatives strong enough to knock out an elephant. The cave was uphill creature would get a whiff, follow the scent, and walk right into it. Plan was, we'd have it contained and mostly unconscious when the chopper dropped a net on top. Textbook, if textbooks covered cryptids. Night two, snow fell heavy, blanketing the ridge. We hunkered down in a blind, Novak snoring loud enough to wake the dead. Tension kept me awake, heart drumming in my ears. Then, a change in the wind. It carried a stink, rotten meat and animal musk. I nudged Novak, pointed. A huge shape was coming up the ridge, loping through the swirling snow. Thing was even bigger than I thought. Jesus! Novak breathed, eyes wide. He grabbed his rifle. It reached the first carcass, hesitated, then ripped into the frozen meat. Perfect. The drugs would start to kick in soon. I keyed the radio, gave the chopper team the signal. I whispered to Novak. Almost time. We heard the chopper before we saw it, blades beating through the storm. Searchlights swung wildly. The creature startled, then reared up on its hind legs, towering over us. Yellow eyes blazed in the swirling light and snow. It let out a roar that echoed across the desolate peaks. And the drugs hit. It staggered for a heartbeat, that massive body suddenly uncoordinated. Novak hooped, let loose a volley of shots, not aiming to kill, but to drive it back. The creature stumbled roared again in confusion and pain. The chopper was on it, searchlight pinning it down as the net dropped. It thrashed, claws tearing at the nylon. Come on, you ugly bastard! Novak was yelling now, caught up in the adrenaline rush of a successful hunt. We hadn't counted on the sheer strength of the thing. I felt a flicker of doubt. We weren't wrangling a rogue bear here but something intelligent, afraid. Yet, stopping now meant it coming back, next time for the townsfolk. The ground was vibrating, tremors shaking through my bones as it fought against the net. Novak had moved forward, reckless as always, gun leveled as if bullets would finish the job. Suddenly, the net tore. Not evenly, but shredded deliberately, its great claws raking as it struggled free. It lunged towards Novak, a blur of tattered net and fury. Novak! I yelled. He didn't have time to react. The creature's full weight slammed into him, sending both of them sprawling into the snow. I heard a sickening crunch, a strangled cry that turned into a wet gurgle. The searchlight swung wildly across the ridge, catching patches of fresh blood staining the white. Novak's rifle abandoned a few feet away, and the creature, a silhouette half-hidden by swirling snow. Then it turned and bolted, disappeared into the maelstrom with that eerie mix of grace and inhuman power. I stumbled over to Novak, dread coiling like a venomous snake in my gut. What was left of him wasn't much. The creature hadn't just killed him, it had torn him apart. My voice shook as I radioed in, choking out the words. Back up, medevac, one dead. But I knew it didn't matter. That thing was out there, hurt, furious, 
and now it had tasted human blood. The cleanup crew arrived in force. Trank teams, soldiers, better armed than us, but I don't think they understood what they were up against. I gave my report numbly. Animal attack, they'd call it, and they'd hunt the surrounding wilderness for a killer bear gone rogue. The creature? We'd slowed it down, maybe. It was out there, blending in with the storm, fading into the vast emptiness of the Alaskan wilds. The suits could spin their lies to the town, but I knew. That was no animal. We weren't dealing with nature gone wrong, but something old and cunning. It wouldn't leave, not without a hell of a fight. In the stark light of dawn, they choppered out Novak's remains, promising his wife whatever story would dull the pain. I stayed, knowing there wasn't much they could do that I couldn't. Maybe this fight was personal now. Maybe I was plain crazy, staying in the one place that monster might call home. Later, sitting in a borrowed truck that stank of stale donuts and despair, I did what the old hunters did. I took stock of gear. I studied faded maps for a place the creature might hole up. I honed the knives Novak always scoffed at, muttering grim prayers into the icy wind. Then I went looking. The aftermath is what the reports don't cover, the stuff no medals get awarded for. It's the tracking those half-familiar footprints through frozen creek beds, the endless nights lying in wait, heart thundering at every rustle in the trees. It's facing the truth, too. That Novak ain't the last to die out here, maybe not even the last this year. People disappear in the wilds all the time, swallowed up by the land. Now, the shadows have teeth. Sometimes I think I see it, a flicker of darkness at the edge of my vision. Sometimes I dream of it, not as the snarling beast, but as it was in the cave, watchful, wounded, more victim than villain. The fight's driven us both into this frozen wilderness, one hunting, one surviving. Some nights... I think back on the life I left in the lower 48. Wife, kids, a whole other world. They'd say it's not worth it, one life against a monster. But sometimes, you make a stand not because it's the smart thing, but because it's the only thing you can do. There's tracks that weren't there yesterday, heading deeper into the mountains. The ammo's heavy in my pockets, the sun's edging up and I don't have time to mourn Novak any longer. The hunt ain't done. Up here, it's never done. One man against a monster, odds stacked like hell. But somewhere deep down, maybe a bit stupid, maybe a bit brave, I reckon I got another round in me yet. This fight? It ain't about killing anymore. It's about not getting killed. Today, at least. Tomorrow? Well, Alaska's always got more mountains, more blizzards coming, and more darkness waiting under the ice. My name is Tristan Bell, and this happened to me on October 6th, 1993. Back then, I was green, cocky. Sure my badge and a gun were all the protection I'd ever need. Now, I'm not so certain. See, I wasn't an ordinary cop. I was part of a hush-hush government task force, the kind you only hear about in conspiracy theories. Our job? Tracking down the things they don't put in textbooks, cryptids, creatures of legend. This mission took us deep into the Okafenoki Swamp, Georgia. Locals up and down the coast whispered tales about a reptilian beast stalking the brackish waters, snatching livestock and the occasional unlucky fisherman. Our higher-ups figured it was a mutant gator or an escaped exotic pet. They were dead wrong. Our squad was me, Brooks, grizzled ex-marine with a shotgun, Nguyen, tech genius, and Carter, leader and resident skeptic. We'd been in the swamp for two weeks, 
and found nothing but gator scat and mosquito bites. Carter was ready to radio back, declare it a hoax. I wasn't. Something about the way locals spoke, the fear in their eyes. There was more to it than tall tales. October 6th, we got our answer. We were setting up motion sensors along a remote channel, thick with cypress trees. The air was heavy, oppressive. Gwyn fiddled with his scanner, frowning. Weird readings off the charts here. He didn't sound scared, just curious. But even Carter looked uneasy. Suddenly, the swamp went deathly silent. No buzzing insects, no croaking frogs. It was like something out there had just flipped a switch. Let's move. This place feels row. Carter didn't get to finish his sentence. The thing exploded from the murky water beside our boat. It was immense, easily twelve feet tall, its scales glistening with slime. It wasn't a gator. It was bipedal, a hulking lizard-man hybrid straight out of a nightmare, its rancid breath scorching our faces. Brooks blasted it with his shotgun, to no effect. Scales like steel armor deflected the buckshot. Carter yelled for us to retreat, but Gwyn, he froze, staring at it, a look of terrible fascination on his face. Before we could drag him away, the creature lashed out with a clawed hand. Gwyn didn't even scream, just a wet thud as his head was torn clean off. We turned and ran, scrambling through the muck, the monster in hot pursuit. Its roars echoed through the dense trees, shaking the ground with each guttural bellow. Carter shouted at me. Split up! Divide and confuse! I hated the plan, but obeyed, veering off into a maze of gnarled roots and murky water. Behind me, I heard Carter yell, then a wet, gurgling sound. I didn't stop running. Couldn't. Every snapping branch... Every rustle in the foliage made my heart hammer. The thing could be anywhere, moving with unnatural stealth. I stumbled, fell hit deep into swamp water. Panic choked me as I tried to claw my way out, slick mud sucking at my boots. Then I saw a glimmer of light up ahead. Carter's flashlight. Could the others have gotten away? I pushed forward, renewed hope burning within me. I burst out of the undergrowth onto a muddy bank, and froze in horror. Carter was there, but only half of him. His torso lay in the muck, the lower half, gone. The flashlight beam flickered across the water, and that's when I saw it. The creature crouched on a cypress branch, its yellow eyes blazing in the darkness. Carter's legs were locked in its monstrous jaws bone crunching like glass. I raised my gun, hand shaking, but I never got a shot off. The creature dove back into the water, disappearing without a trace. I didn't wait around. Somehow, I made it back to camp, radioed for help. They descended like vultures, black suits and grim faces. Combed the swamp for days, found nothing. No bodies, no trace of the monster. Official report, animal attack. Carter and Gwyn fell victim to the hazards of the swamp. But I know the truth. The Okafinoki holds something far darker and more dangerous than any gator. And maybe, just maybe, it doesn't like being hunted. My name is Jason Cole, and this happened to me on October 12, 1997. I work in a specialized field. You might call us monster hunters. That's the closest way to describe it, though there's paperwork involved that makes the job title more boring than that. It's hush-hush work for obvious reasons. I know it sounds crazy, but trust me, there are things out there that the general public doesn't need to know about. This particular assignment was out in Washington State, 
near the town of Forks. Not much to do out there besides logging and enduring the constant rain, but that's the kind of place we thrive, remote. Our intel suggested rumors of a series of disappearances. Hikers and campers vanishing with very little in the way of evidence. Now we get sent on a whole lot of wild goose chases. Most of those disappearances turn out to be misadventure or plain old foul play among fellow humans. But every once in a while, something in the report suggests something else. That's where my team comes in. There were four of us on the mission, myself, the field leader, Riley, our animal expert, Garcia, the tactician, and Wilson, young and inexperienced but enthusiastic. We arrived in town a couple of days before starting the real work. The idea was to blend in and scope out the terrain. Small towns make that tough. Within a day, everybody in the greasy diner seemed to know we were new faces, asking questions about the missing persons. Night two, we finally decided to get out into the woods. We're a cautious bunch. Night ops give us an edge, even with our fancy night vision gear. This particular spot was a few hours' drive from Forks, along logging roads before we hit a trail and started hiking. It was the last known location of a missing logger. Now, it hadn't been a clean disappearance, even by our standards. There was, well, let's just say a lot of blood, and leave it at that. We reached the area a little before midnight. The moon was out, which always makes things a bit trickier. We spread out, covering as much ground as we could quietly. The forest was dead silent, not so much as a squirrel. I started walking, scanning the ground and tree lines systematically. I'd done this a hundred times, but that prickle up your spine never goes away especially not in a place so isolated. Something caught my eye a flash of movement high up in a tree. At first, I assumed it was my imagination. Or, more likely, an owl or something. But I kept my eyes on the spot. My skin crawled. Then it moved again, this time clear as day. It was a figure, large and dark against the moonlight, hunched over a branch. For a split second, I thought, hell, is that a bear? Then I saw the eyes. They shone back at me, not like any animal. They were yellow, slit pupils, intelligent. Panic flared inside me, but years of training kicked in. I dropped into a crouch, signaled alert to the others with a hand gesture. I could hear them moving closer, converging on my position. The thing watched, unmoving. It had to know we were there. We formed a rough semicircle, weapons trained on the figure, though my gut told me our standard-issue rifles weren't going to do much if this thing decided to attack. Garcia broke the silence with a whispered command. Identify yourself! The thing in the tree stayed silent. Then, ever so slowly, it stood. Jesus, it was tall taller than a man should be, and inhumanly thin. Its limbs were long, too long, and its movements were jerky and unnatural. My mind raced. Was it even real? Was I hallucinating? That thing, whatever it was, it dropped from the tree branch like it weighed nothing. It landed with an inhuman thud, crouched like some predatory spider, those yellow eyes still fixed on us. Identify yourself, Garcia demanded again, voice tighter now. I don't know who fired first. It might have been Wilson. In the blink of an eye, the thing was on him. There was a blur of motion, a scream, a sickening crunch. Then Wilson was gone, vanished like a magician's trick. Just a pool of blood remained on the forest floor. We opened fire unloading our magazines into the creature. It hissed and twitched, but rounds seemed to pass right through it. I caught a glimpse of its face in the strobing light of our gunfire, sunken cheeks, 
taut, translucent skin, a jagged row of teeth. Then it was gone, faded into the trees like smoke. There was just silence again, except for Garcia sobbing and the smell of blood and gunpowder hanging heavy in the night air. And that was just the beginning. The aftermath was chaos. Pure, unadulterated chaos. Our calm, practiced ops planning flew out the window. Garcia was a mess, a blubbering shell of his usual tactical self. I wasn't much better, the image of Wilson disappearing into, whatever that had been, seared into my brain. But I was the field leader, duty demanded action. We had to get out of there. I patched Garcia up with what little medical supplies we had. His wounds were superficial, the shock far deeper. We left Wilson behind, no way to carry him, no way to explain him to the authorities. We didn't even look for a body. It didn't seem real, somehow. Huddled together, we stumbled back to our vehicle. Every snapping twig sent a jolt of terror through me. I kept expecting that unnatural figure to burst from the darkness, its eyes glowing, its limbs reaching. We made it back to town somehow, battered and demoralized. Our first priority was to contact HQ. Even with the secure lines, it was a hell of a story to relay. What we knew, what we'd seen, what we'd done, or rather, failed to do. They dispatched a clean-up crew masquerading as some kind of hazmat team. Perks of being a government-sanctioned group. Messes can be neatly covered up. Our team was disbanded on the spot. Discharge, medical records scrubbed, the whole nine yards. Garcia took it the worst. He spiraled, started ranting about government conspiracies and monsters hiding in plain sight. They locked him up. A psychiatric ward was better than a jail cell. They offered me a desk job, pushing papers in some windowless office. But I couldn't live with myself if I just retired. After the initial shock wore off, something turned hard and angry inside of me. If the world thought these things were myths, then fine. I'd be the hunter in the shadows, a one-man crusade against the creatures that lurked on the fringes. It wasn't easy. I spent years scraping together resources, tracking down leads that were mostly whispered rumors and internet conspiracy theories. But I got better, smarter. I learned how to vanish, how to live off the grid. I built up a small arsenal beyond what the government had issued me, silver bullets from melted-down jewelry, custom knives with weird occult symbols. It felt insane even to me sometimes. Then came the break I'd been hunting for. I caught wind of a similar cluster of disappearances up in Alaska. Small town stuff, hunters and fishermen vanishing without a trace, their wrecked campsites leaving behind more questions than answers. Same pattern, which in my book meant it was probably the same damned species we'd encountered in Washington. I traveled there under a false name, a rugged drifter looking for odd jobs in a land that attracts such folks. It turned out luck was on my side. One of the locals, an old inert man, noticed me casing the woods and took pity, or perhaps had his own suspicions. He told me stories, hushed whispers around a campfire about the Calipalic. Old legends, he said but he swore he'd seen something out on the ice. Something large, humanoid, but not human. It was thin evidence, but it was all I needed. I spent weeks hunting those desolate ice fields. It was harsh, brutal work, and the isolation gnawed at me. But I refused to give in. That thing, whatever it was, it had taken Wilson. It had ruined Garcia's sanity and likely the lives of countless others. It needed to be stopped. One frozen afternoon I saw it. A dark shape hunched over a seal carcass, its movements inhuman despite its resemblance to a man. 
I took aim, my hands steady, my breath held tight in my chest. The rifle bucked in my shoulder. The bullet found its mark, but the creature hardly reacted. I fired again and again until it finally slumped to the ice, its yellow eyes fading. I approached cautiously. It was bigger up close. Its features were almost skeletal, its skin a grotesque, mottled gray. The mouth was all wrong, a jagged maw filled with needle-like teeth. I felt a wave of nausea and relief all at once. Not the satisfaction of a hunter killing its prey, but the grim resolve of someone who knows there's more work to be done. Victory was fleeting. In the days that followed, I found other carcasses. Bear, caribou, torn apart in a way no predator I knew would manage. My creature was patient, strategic even. But it was also leaving a trail, an unintentional invitation for a persistent hunter like me. I followed that trail, further and further into the frozen wastes. The clues became sparser, my supplies dwindling. But something drove me forward, a burning hatred mixed with a stubborn, desperate hope. My journey led me to a hidden cave network, slick with ice and smelling faintly of decay. And there, in the shadows, more of those yellow eyes gleamed. Not one creature, but a whole tribe. What happened next is a blur. There was gunfire, echoing in the icy tunnels. There was blood, some of it mine. There were screams that weren't quite human. And there was that terrible, loping run back into the blinding white wilderness, the knowledge that I hadn't stopped anything. They were still out there. I had failed, and yet, perhaps had won the tiniest glimmer of information that might, hopefully, save someone else someday. I don't know how I made it back to civilization. I have vague memories of stumbling into an isolated village, collapsing, and then being airlifted to a hospital. When I finally regained full consciousness— it was to news that sent a chill down my spine far worse than anything the Arctic wind could have done. News of disappearances near Forks, Washington. The cycle had begun again. My name is Travis Dunn, and this happened to me on July 22nd. 2009. I don't even know how to tell this. Makes me sound nuts, I guess, but this stuff is my job. You see, I don't fix potholes for the city. I work for the folks who get called in when things, things most people don't believe even exist, cause problems. Yeah, I'm one of those monster hunters you always joked about. Only, we work for the government, so it's all official hush-hush stuff. This particular business trip started in Arizona. You ever been there in July? It melts your brain, it's so damn hot. Not exactly where you want to be in full tactical gear. But the locals had been reporting some disturbing stuff, campers going missing in a stretch of desert outside Flagstaff. Turns out, small towns hear everything. The disappearances themselves... Well, folks vanish in the wilderness, sadly. Misjudge the terrain, dehydration takes hold, it happens. But these were different. Whispers started making the rounds about, well, about creatures. Big, shadowy things moving faster than any animal should. Talk about eyes glowing in the night. Yeah, folks were scared. So, here I was with my team... Peterson, the tech expert, Ramirez with his outdoorsman knowledge and quiet ways, and Dr. Evans, our resident biologist with the no-nonsense attitude. Not your average office crew, that's for sure. We spent the first few days scouting the area. It was rough terrain, rocky gorges, those weird cactus things standing like sentinels. Ramirez found some tracks. Now I've been doing this since I was a green recruit, 
and I've seen weird stuff. But these things, they were big, like a man. But the prints were all wrong, too many toes, claws too long. Evans took careful moldings, muttering about bone structure and evolution gone sideways. Night fell quickly in the desert, which is good for stakeouts, and not so good for the nerves. It was my turn on watch. The first few hours passed with just the usual desert sounds, the odd lizard scuttling past, the distant wail of a coyote. Then I swear I heard something else. A heavy, shuffling noise from up a ridge. I held my breath, rifle ready. A shadow moved across the rocks, blotting out the moonlight for a moment. Whatever it was, it was big, bipedal at least. It moved cautiously toward one of the campsites we'd set up, a dummy camp with a thermal sensor rig by Peterson. My finger was on the trigger, heart pounding. Then the thing stopped, hunched over with its back to me. My training told me to take the shot, to neutralize the creature. But something held me back. It was the posture, a hesitation I couldn't explain. Humans don't stand like that. Not unless. A snap of a branch made it bolt. I saw it clearly then. It wasn't like anything in our manuals. Sure, it was tall, maybe seven feet, and thin, with skin so pale it was almost luminous but its arms were too long, ending in wicked-looking claws. And its face, if you could call it that. No eyes, just slits. A mouth lipless and gaping wide with rows of needle-like teeth. Then it was gone, vanishing into the rocks like it wasn't even solid. I signaled the others. They found me wide-eyed and probably pale as a ghost. The thermal sensor hadn't picked up anything. Ramirez found more tracks, clear prints heading away from the camp into deeper desert. It's out there, I told them. And it's smart. The next day, we tracked it. That desert was unforgiving, sun beating down, every rock and shadow starting to look like our target. Ramirez was the best at spotting the tracks. He'd stop, study the ground, then beckon us forward. Hours went by. We were getting reckless, spread out too far. It was just after noon when I heard Peterson cry out. I ran towards the sound, rifle raised. Up ahead, Peterson was on the ground, thrashing, something dark wrapped around him. My mind stuttered. Was I seeing this right? The thing was a tangle of limbs, spindly and far too numerous like some nightmarish spider. Its body, if it had one, was small, hunched over Peterson. It was sucking on him, or something. I fired, emptying half my magazine into the damn thing. It shrieked, a rasping inhuman noise, and scrambled off Peterson, leaving behind a tangle of bloody limbs. Peterson, I won't describe what I saw. The thing got him good. Ripped him apart, drank from him. We don't carry field medics on our missions, and it wouldn't have mattered. Ramirez and Evans arrived. Ramirez helped me drag Peterson's ruined body into a dip in the rocks for some semblance of a burial. We didn't say much. Peterson, the tech whiz, our lifeline back to base, was gone. I was in charge now. Should I call it off? Get the hell out of there? No, fury burned in me. That thing was out there, still hunting. We had to stop it. We followed the tracks further, Evans collecting samples of blood she couldn't identify, Ramirez grim-faced, and me seeing Peterson's death every time I blinked. By nightfall, the tracks led us to a cave, a black hole in the side of a cliff. I don't like this, Ramirez muttered. Well, tough, cause we're going in. I snapped, reckless and angry. Inside the cave, it stank. Damp, moldy, something else, rotten. We flicked on our helmet flashlights, 
creating a tunnel of light in the darkness. The cave wound downwards. The tracks were fresh here, clearer marks in the soft earth. Evans took more samples, muttering something about troglobites, things that adapt to absolute darkness. Whatever this creature was, it had been down here a long, long time. We descended deeper. The air grew clammy, and I had that unsettling tingle at the back of my neck, the feeling that something was watching us. Even Ramirez, usually so stoic, had his hand tight on his rifle. The cave opened into a larger chamber, a cathedral of twisted rock formations. And then I saw it. Not the spider thing. That had been some kind of horrific outlier, thank God. This creature stood in the center of the chamber. It was humanoid, the size of a large man. Long, emaciated limbs, skin almost translucent showing the network of veins and bones beneath. But its head. It was bald, the skull an elongated dome, tapering to a pointed chin with no discernible mouth. Where a human would have eyes were just smooth, blank sockets. It held something in its clawed hands, something small and bundled, emitting soft, whimpering cries. Oh my God! Evans whispered, horrified. The creature was hunched over, protectively. Then I realized, the bundle wasn't animal prey. It was a human child, a toddler at most. Filthy, thin, but alive. It stared up at the monster with big, terrified eyes. It, it took a kid, Ramirez choked out. He raised his rifle. I hesitated, a thousand conflicting thoughts crashing through my head. The creature looked up, sensing our presence. Its head tilted in that oddly bird-like way. Then, it dropped the child and lunged at us with impossible speed. There was a blur of movement, the crack of Ramirez's rifle, and a guttural scream echoing in the cave. Retreat! I yelled. We scrambled back up the narrow tunnel, firing blindly. The thing was behind us, its shrieks bouncing off the rock walls. Evan stumbled, losing her footing. I turned back, saw the creature close in, extending its long arm with its impossibly sharp claws. I fired, more out of desperation than strategy. There was a screech, the sound of something tearing. Evan screamed, but the creature was gone, retreating deeper into the cave. I reached down, hauled Evans to her feet. We staggered out into the fading desert light, leaving a trail of blood behind us. Evan's leg was a mess. The claws had ripped through muscle, narrowly missing bone. We patched her up as best we could, adrenaline finally wearing off, leaving us shaking and hollow. There was no way we could pursue that thing, not now. But I knew it was still down there, waiting, with its child captive. Reaching base was a grueling ordeal. My report was a jumbled mess of half-truths and omissions. Peterson's death was logged as an animal attack, Ramirez and I marked as injured during a routine patrol. Evans, pale and haunted, refused to speak about what she'd seen. It was all covered up, as usual. They told us to go home, to rest and recover. Recover, you're yeah, right. They offered counseling, the kind designed to erase memories, to make obedient soldiers out of traumatized survivors. I refused. Some things you can't forget, even if you want to. Ramirez quit soon after. Disappeared off the grid, trying to find his own kind of peace, I guess. Evans took a long leave, and I didn't blame her. Me, I couldn't walk away. I requested another assignment, this time up north. Heard there were disappearances in the Alaskan wilderness, bears behaving strangely, hunters vanishing. Sound familiar? I started packing my bags. The duffel was standard issue, the guns government sanctioned. 
but among the supplies I stashed away were a few things off the books. A homemade UV flashlight, a vial of liquid silver, a worn book filled with sketches of creatures that don't officially exist. My own little hunter's toolkit. This time, it's personal. Yeah, I still do the job, neutralize those threats to national security. I follow orders, otherwise they shut you down quick. But somewhere out there in the shadows, that cave creature exists. Maybe it's alone, maybe it's one of many. Doesn't matter. I won't stop until I find it. Until I rescue that child, or avenge it. Until I finally put a bullet in the brain of that eyeless, pointy-headed bastard. Because that's the thing about monsters, the real ones anyway. They don't just disappear. And neither do the people who hunt them. Months later, I stood near a remote Alaskan outpost, rifle cradled in my arms, watching the snow swirl. Ramirez had once told me an old Apache legend about hunters turning into the thing they chased too long. Maybe he was right. I didn't care. The cold had settled into my bones, a different kind of chill than the Arizona desert, but the same kind of determination fueled me. My radio crackled. It was base, with news of a mangled body found half-buried in the ice, a missing logger with strange puncture wounds on his torso. Looks like my hunt had just begun. My name is Derek Walker and this happened to me on February 8, 2015. People assume that being a monster hunter is like some video game, all badass gear and adrenaline-fueled shootouts. It ain't. Most of the time, it's driving through the middle of nowhere in a crappy government van, squinting at old maps, and eating gas station snacks that expired sometime during the Bush administration. But you do this job long enough, you learn to trust that gut feeling. The prickle in the back of your neck that says something ain't right, even when everything seems normal. And man, did I ever have that feeling pulling into the town of Blackwater, tucked away deep in the main woods. First glance, Blackwater looked about as thrilling as a used tire store. Main Street, couple of boarded up shops, old church, the whole small town in decline deal. Folks at the diner eyed us like we were aliens. I guess strangers don't come by often. Turns out, they had reason to be nervous. We were there for the disappearances. Over a year, a dozen folks vanished without a trace. Locals muttered about wild animals, crazy hermits living in the woods, the usual theories. But see... We've got case files bulging with cases where bears don't leave that kind of mess behind. My team was the standard field ops deal. Michaels, the by-the-books ex-military leader. Chin, the animal tracking expert. And then there was Jessup, the rookie, all big eyes and nervous energy. I was the old hand, been sniffing out cryptids since before most of them were even born. We spent a few days scoping things out, talking to locals. Mostly dead ends, folks scared about something out there, but no concrete sightings. Jessup joked at night about us being paid to chase ghost stories. Yeah, kid hadn't seen what I'd seen, didn't know things don't need to show themselves to be dangerous. The break came, like always, thanks to bad luck. Two hikers turned up in the woods, barely alive. We were the closest official folks, so we got the call. Hospital visit wasn't pretty. They'd been out in the woods just overnight, but it looked like they'd been torn apart by wild animals. Problem was, doctors said the injuries were wrong. Claw marks all over, but deep, precise, like something with surgical tools had gone to work. The survivor... When he could talk, said, well, he said a lot of crazy stuff, 
mostly gibberish about shadows whispering and eyes in the trees. But one thing made me sit up and listen. He mentioned an old cabin, a root cellar, something inhuman lurking inside. Seemed like a thin lead, but it was all we had. Night three in Blackwater, and we headed out to that spot he described. Michaels was calling the shots, all tactical and serious. He set Chen and Jessup up as overwatch, while I accompanied him to the cabin itself. Now I've done some night ops in spooky places, but this felt different. The woods were dead silent, no crickets, not even an owl hooting unnerving, that kind of wrong quiet. Cabin was small, run down like you'd expect, half-rotted porch, and yeah, a root cellar door built into the hillside. We approached cautiously, night vision gear humming. I had a strange feeling about the place, like a buzzing at the edge of my hearing. Michaels kicked open the root cellar door. It was musty in there, the smell of wet earth thick. He flicked on his flashlight. I braced myself, half expecting something to jump out at us. The beam of light swept across their walls, old preserves jars, and nothing. Well, that was anticlimactic, Jessup muttered over the radio, a little too relieved for my liking. Stay sharp, Michaels warned, ever professional. I stepped inside, my own flashlight probing the gloom. Something seemed off. The air felt heavy, close. Then a noise. A scuttling, like claws on stone. I swung my beam, ready for anything. There, in a far corner, huddled in shadow, was a figure. It took a second for my brain to catch up with my eyes. It was crouched, unnaturally thin and long-limbed, skin stretched so tight over bone it looked almost skeletal. No hair, not that I could see, and the head. Jesus. The head was huge, bald, with two gaping holes where the eyes should have been. But the worst was the mouth. An impossibly wide slit filled with rows of tiny, needle-sharp teeth. The whole effect made my stomach lurch. It hissed, a sound like air escaping a punctured tire. I yelled, Hostile! and raised my rifle. Michaels fired into the root cellar almost before I'd finished shouting. The damn thing darted away with uncanny speed, its limbs blurring like some nightmare insect. And then chaos. Michaels stumbled, swore, and his flashlight went rolling as he dropped. The root cellar plunged into darkness. We could hear it, though, scrambling, those claws scraping against the walls. Shots rang out, ours and something else. A shriek, a wet tearing sound, and then Jessup screamed, his voice cut short. My blood ran cold. Jessup! Chin yelled on the radio, panic in his voice. Cover me! I snapped, scrambling for Michael's dropped flashlight. The beam flickered back on just in time to see Michael struggling on the root cellar floor, the creature on top of him. Its claws raked his chest, blood spraying, and his gun lay just out of reach. I fired, emptying half my magazine into that thing. It recoiled, hissing, leaving Michael's a gasping wreck. I dragged him out of the root cellar, slamming the door shut, fumbling to lock it. What the hell was that? Chin shouted, his voice ragged. We gotta get out of here. I gasped. We ran back through the woods, the thing screeching and clawing at the root cellar door behind us. Jessup was gone. Vanished into the darkness, the only trace a pool of blood near where his rifle lay abandoned. Back at the safe house, it was a disaster. Michaels was bleeding out, incoherent, muttering about teeth and eyes in the dark. Chin was patched up, but he'd lost his damn nerve, staring straight ahead with that thousand-yard stare of Etzgit. I was in charge, 
and fury bubbled inside me, hot and acidic. Jessup, the rookie, dead on his first real mission. And that thing, that goddamn eyeless abomination, was still out there. I radioed for backup. They sent in a whole tactical team, the kind with the spooky black uniforms and serious firepower. Medics whisked Michaels away to some black ops hospital where maybe, just maybe, they could save him. We briefed the new guys, my voice shaking slightly despite my attempts to sound calm. They gave us those pitying yet scared looks you get when the old-timers tell the ghost stories. The higher-ups decided the sensible thing was to bomb the hell out of the woods at dawn. Napalm, bunker busters, the whole works. Sanitize the area, clean up the problem, whatever the hell it was. I didn't like it, but when your bosses come calling with those stars on their uniforms, you don't argue. Chim refused to go back. They hauled him off, probably to be locked up in one of those quiet psychiatric wards. I didn't blame him. Some things break you in ways that no amount of training prepares you for. I went back out to the woods. It was cold, dawn barely breaking. The tactical guys were setting up, their movements efficient and silent. Part of me wanted to go with them, storm back to that accursed root cellar. But a colder, wiser part of me held back. I'd seen that thing's speed, its brutality. No amount of armor would help you if it decided you were its next snack. Instead, I headed up to a ridge overlooking where the cabin was. Figured I'd give overwatch, do some last scans for anything out of the ordinary, then be gone when the real fireworks started. Took me almost an hour to find it. Not the creature, but a trail. It was faint, the sort of thing only someone like Chin could track normally. But with the creature having shredded Jessup, its scent was strong, a metallic tang mixed with rot. The trail led deeper into the woods, away from the cabin. What the hell was it doing? Something about its movements after attacking us, they didn't seem random. This was deliberate. A reckless thought hit me. That thing wasn't some wild predator, but intelligent, twisted perhaps, but cunning and it was running. The tactical team radioed. Thirty minutes to detonation. Change of plans, I replied. I wasn't sure what the hell I had in mind, but I couldn't just leave that thing to escape while we nuked the forest. It'd only come back, or move on to terrorize some other unsuspecting town. There had to be an end to it. The trail was fresh, unsettlingly so. This close, even with the cover of the woods, you'd expect the creature to be spooked by the noise from the tactical team. But it seemed unconcerned. And that's when I knew something was very, very wrong. The forest opened into a clearing I didn't recognize. And there, in the center, stood an old, crumbling stone church. The kind with stained glass windows and a bell tower pointing accusingly at the sky. This deep in the woods, it felt out of place. A shape darted from the shadows of the church towards the tree line. For a moment, the rising sun caught it. And what I saw made my blood freeze despite the sweat trickling down my back. The creature, it was carrying something. Small, limp, in its wicked claws. A human child, a girl no older than six or seven. Alive but unconscious. Rage swept over me. It had been kidnapping people. Not eating them, well, not right away, but keeping them. For what purpose, I couldn't fathom. What dark rituals did this monster perform in that forgotten, unholy church? I charged forward, breaking cover. Stupid, maybe suicidal, but I couldn't live with myself if I just stood there. The thing saw me and screeched, a sound that ripped through the trees. It dropped the child, turning to face me. Its eyeless sockets seemed to fix on me, and somehow, I knew it saw me. 
It moved faster than I thought possible, a blur of limbs and claws. I dodged the first strike, more instinct than skill. I fired, more to buy a second than actually hit the damn thing. My bullet seemed to bounce off its tough hide. It was close enough that I smelled it a sour stench of rotting meat and damp earth. I swung the rifle like a club, hitting it across the face. The impact was more jarring than I expected. The thing screeched again, stumbling. One of its claws sliced across my arm burning pain shot through me. I staggered back, raising the rifle once more. But it was already retreating, dragging itself back towards that cursed church. It snatched the girl and vanished through the church's crumbling doorway. I stood there, panting, blood dripping down my arm, knowing I'd failed. Then the tactical team's commander was on the radio, voice tense. Detonation in five minutes. I retreated, ran like hell through the forest until I was clear of the blast zone. I told headquarters the creature was gone, neutralized. Lied through my teeth like every damn survivor ever has. That night, bandaged up and back in some sterile hotel room, I packed my things. Some extra weapons I'd, requisitioned, over the years, stashed in my standard-issue duffel bag. There was unfinished business out there, a whole town of folks still scared, and that little girl, somewhere in that crumbling church with the thing from nightmares. The higher-ups would write me off as PTSD. That happens when you tell the truth about the things that lurk in the shadows. But I wasn't done, not by a long shot. Blackwater didn't have a monster problem anymore. Now, that monster had me. My name is Kay Thompson, and this happened to me on October 6, 2003. Folks assume anyone in my line of work is some kind of thrill junkie. Truth is, I'm not. Married, two young kids. I crave routine after seeing what I see on those secret missions for the government. But hey, they pay well, and well, those mouths gotta be fed. This particular assignment was out in Washington State. Remote part of the Cascades. All big pines and glacial lakes. Picture postcard stuff, until you remember what locals whisper about out there. Sightings of something big and hairy. Hikers gone missing. The usual Bigfoot-type rumors. My team consisted of me, point man with more field experience than I care to admit along with Ramirez, our tech expert, Dr. Evans, the wildlife biologist with a skeptical frown permanently etched on her face, and Novak, fresh-faced and straight out of Quantico. Figured it'd at least be a routine debunk the local legends gig. We spent two weeks setting up camp, tracking transects, and placing camera traps. Silch. Locals started giving us the side-eye muttering about wasting taxpayer dollars. Honestly, part of me agreed. Even if cryptids were real, they're usually smart enough to avoid our gear. But orders are orders. Night patrols were when the boredom turned into creeping unease. Woods like that, they get awfully quiet. No crickets, no frogs, not even the wind seemed to catch in the treetops. Silence like that throws you off, gets under your skin. Then came the break, and it wasn't on any of our fancy surveillance. A ranger radioed in, body found, half-eaten, claw marks, the works. Up on a ridge, overlooking a ravine. Perfect ambush spot, whatever did the job. Up we trekked, the mood grim. Sight was a mess, worse than the usual bear attack. Blood spatter over an area way too large, the remains. Well, let's just say it took Dr. Evans a while to confirm it was even human. Claw gashes were precise, not the frenzy you expect from a wild animal. Bigfoot with a butcher knife? 
Novak choked nervously, but nobody laughed. Evans ran her scanner over the remains, face creased in concentration. Inconclusive, as usual. But the wounds, the efficiency, it's unsettling. She finally looked up, catching my eye. We both knew, you see enough weirdness in this work, you get a feel for when something ain't just nature acting wild. Night fell quickly. We decided to post guards, me and Ramirez taking the first shift. Crouching in the shadows, rifle ready, I scanned the ravine below. Moonlight was weak, and my night vision goggles only did so much. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a branch, had my heart thundering. Hours passed. Nothing. Ramirez whispered a joke to lighten the mood. That's when we saw it. Across the ravine, maybe two hundred yards away, a figure materialized from the darkness. It was tall, too tall for a man, and hunched over. At first, I thought it was a bear, reared on its hind legs. But then it moved into a shaft of moonlight. The skin was pale, almost translucent, with thick, corded muscle visible underneath. Arms were way too long and hung almost to its knees. The head, that's what made me truly lose it. Balding skull stretched long and narrow, and where eyes should be, there was just smooth skin and a gaping, lipless mouth. It turned its head slowly, as if sniffing the air. Sweet Jesus! Ramirez breathed next to me. It cocked its head at the sound, then... With a sickeningly smooth motion, it dropped onto all fours and charged. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the silent night. The creature staggered under the impact of our bullets, but kept coming. It was inhumanly fast, zigzagging through the trees like a damn monkey hyped up on meth. Panic flared in me. This wasn't some reclusive Sasquatch. This was a predator intelligent and bloodthirsty. We retreated, firing behind us to slow it down, stumbling back towards camp. Ramirez screamed. I spun around. He tripped and was tangled in some exposed tree roots. Before I could reach him, the creature was on him. What followed was a blur of screeching, gunfire, something snapping with a sickening wet sound, and then a terrible gurgling silence. I aimed my flashlight. Ramirez was, it was hard to tell what was even left of him. The creature had ripped him apart with a ferocity that turned my stomach. I stumbled backwards, blind with terror and rage, and then I was falling, tumbling down the back of the ridge into the ravine, hitting my head on a rock, everything going black. I woke up to a cold dawn seeping through the trees. My head pounded, and my leg throbbed in a way that meant broken. But I was alive. The creature was gone. I dragged myself towards the trail, a crawl that felt endless. When I stumbled back into camp, it was to find the remnants of a nightmare. Tent shredded, gear scattered. Blood, and a lot of it, but no bodies. Evans and Novak vanished. I called for backup, voice choked with a horror they wouldn't believe. The cleanup crew arrived. Standard protocol. Sanitize the area. No trace left of the dead, or of what killed them. They patched me up, confiscated my notes. I saw in their eyes the same thing townsfolk had looked at us with a mix of pity and the quiet certainty that I'd cracked under the strain. Back home, the nightmares started. Dreams of that eyeless face and gnashing teeth, of Ramirez's screams, of the little girl's torn and tattered dress I'd found half-hidden near the base camp. Yeah, we never caught on to that part. The creature hadn't just been hunting us, it had been collecting. I started drinking heavily and snapping at my wife, the steady life I'd craved crumbling in my hands. They offered the desk job, the early retirement. I refused. 
I got transferred instead, requested someplace hot and dry this time. Figured no trees, no cryptids. But I know better now. They're out there, lurking in the blind spots at the edge of our vision. And they're getting bolder. My name is Jason Pierce, and this happened to me on July 23, 2010. You ever find yourself telling those kinds of stories at a bar? Folks give you that half-pitying, half-amused look, figure you tank too many beers back in the day. Me, ain't touched the stuff since. See, I do some specialized field work for some even more specialized folks in the government. The kind of work that makes monster movies look like bedtime stories. Started right out of college, thought it'd be some exciting wildlife tracking gig, with maybe a Bigfoot sighting thrown in to spice things up. Then I saw my first, well, let's just say the world's a lot weirder than textbooks let on. This particular business trip was Montana. Big sky country, yeah but the area we were sent to was more big empty. Tiny town with a gas station and a diner whose pie was so bad it should have been classified as a bioweapon. Locals were jumpy, cattle mysteriously disappearing, weird howls echoing through the mountains at night, and one poor hiker vanished without a trace. Standard enough call for people in my line. My team was a mixed bag. There was Dr. Walsh, all prickly skepticism and precise notes. Miller, young and eager, the kind who still believed in hunting down the mythical with a fancy camera. And then there was old Carter. Ex-military, about as talkative as a tree stump, but the guy had a sixth sense for danger that had seen him through some nasty situations. We spent the first few days scouting. Montana ain't small, and pinpointing something clever enough to evade detection was like finding a needle in a damn haystack. Walsh was doing her samples routine. Miller got obsessed with some large, unidentifiable paw prints. And me, I just got that itchy feeling crawling up my spine. Carter, too, I noticed. That alone was enough to put me on high alert. Night fell like a heavy blanket. Even in summer... It got cold up in those mountains. We hunkered around a measly campfire, listening to the unsettling silence of the wilderness. Suddenly, Carter sat bolt upright, eyes narrowed, peering into the darkness. Something's out there, he rasped, his voice barely a whisper. I grabbed my rifle, the night vision rig strapped to my head making the world a sickly green. Miller scrambled to set up an infrared camera, hands shaking a little in the dim light. Walsh just rolled her eyes. Carter, for God's sake. That's when it hit us. Not sight, not sound, but smell. Like rotting meat and wet earth and something sharp underneath, a stink that made your stomach clench. Then, from the blackness beyond the firelight, two eyes opened. Yellow, slit pupil things, glowing with their own malevolent light. They were high off the ground, higher than any wolf or bear ought to be. The creature that belonged to those eyes stayed hidden in the shadows, just observing us. Carter swore and raised his rifle. I hesitated, a primal fear making the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Hold your fire, I hissed. Not unless it charges. The damn thing seemed to understand, because a low chuckle echoed through the trees. Not an animal noise, but something mocking, intelligent. My blood turned to ice. This wasn't just some opportunistic predator. It was playing with us. I think. Walsh's voice was squeaky, her usual composure cracking. I think we should get back to the truck didn't need to tell me twice. Retreating to the flimsy safety of our vehicles felt like the longest walk of my life. 
Something rustled in the bushes parallel to our path, but we didn't dare look. The air crackled with tension, the feeling of being watched pressing down on us. We made it back, piled into the truck, and slammed the doors shut. For a moment, there was just the sound of our panicked breathing. Then came the scratching. It started at the back of the truck, claws scraping against metal. Then on the windows, tapping like it wanted in. Miller whimpered, clutching at his camera like a lucky charm. The yellow eyes peered through the windshield, inches from my face. I couldn't make out much in the dark and the grainy night vision, but I saw enough. The thing was hunched, limbs too long and thin to be natural, its head huge and misshapen. The skin was a sickly gray, stretched tight over bone. Its mouth, it had too many teeth, a jagged, needle-like mess stretching in a grin that was more of a grimace. Then, it knocked twice on the glass and melted back into the night. Drive! Walsh screeched. Drive, drive, drive! I shoved the truck into gear and stomped on the gas. We roared off down the dirt track, bouncing and swerving like lunatics. Carter scanned the tree line, rifle at the ready. Miller sobbed quietly in the back, staring at his camera with dead eyes. We didn't stop till we hit the highway. Even then, didn't slow down until we crossed the state border. When morning light finally broke, we pulled into a rundown motel, exhausted and shaken to the core. Miller quit the next day. Smart man. Walsh, she started drinking heavily, lost the last of her academic skepticism in the bottom of a bottle. Carter vanished off the grid. Some say he's still in the mountains, hunting the thing that hunted us. Me, I'm still doing the job. Gotta pay the bills, and someone's gotta do it. But I sleep with a gun under my pillow and a flashlight on my bedside table. And every single time I turn off the light those eyes, those damned glowing yellow eyes, come back to me. They'll always be out there, lurking in the darkness, waiting. My name is David Reed, and this happened to me in September 2011. I never talk about this, and I don't tell stories. But I have the feeling you won't believe me. I work for a secret government monster hunting agency, and you won't find any info on it online. It's better this way. If this got out, you know. People in suits knocking at your door at midnight wouldn't be a surprise. Our team has a name, Phantom. I'm the recon guy. I scout, analyze, and report back. We were called to a national forest in Northern California. It was a simple missing persons case initially. Hikers, campers gone without a trace. No bodies, no evidence. Locals blamed bears and mountain lions, and it made sense, but there were too many disappearances over a short period. And then came the messed up stuff. There were photos. Blurry, but you couldn't miss it. A huge, dark figure, hunched over a, well, let's just say it didn't resemble a pile of leaves anymore. It was humanoid, but taller than any basketball player and built thick. Those photos were what got us involved. We arrived late one night. There were four of us. Jensen, the muscle of the team, a real hothead. Simmons, the tech expert, the brains. Miller, our medic and a good man, probably the only reason I survived. And me, David Reed, the eyes and ears. We set up camp near a trailhead. It was an unseasonably warm night. Even for late summer, it was odd. We kept watching shifts two on, two off. Miller and I took first watch. The hours were uneventful. Sounds of the forest, the usual. 
We handed off to Simmons and Jensen around two in the morning. I woke to a scream. A man screamed full of terror. Jensen's voice. I grabbed my rifle, Miller beside me. We were out of the tent in a flash, but Simmons was gone. His sleeping bag torn open, a single drag mark through the dirt, and his trail ending in the dense undergrowth of the forest. A growl, low and primal, echoed from the darkness. It wasn't any sound I recognized. Miller raised his flashlight and swept the beam across the tree lean. Two eyes, massive and reflective, stared back at us. Oh, God! Miller breathed. It was just a glimpse before the thing retreated back into the shadows. Its outline moved wrong, unsettling. Too long in the arms, in the legs, a loping stride that was all power and unnatural speed. Jensen was still screaming for Simmons, his voice hoarse. We pulled him back towards the tent. We have to go after him. Jensen snarled, shaking us off. No, I said firmly. We call this in, wait for backup. And let that thing pick us off one by one, Jensen shouted. He had a point, but I wasn't throwing our lives away. I grabbed the radio, but there was nothing but static. Our equipment was jammed. It knows, Miller spoke, his eyes wide. He wasn't wrong. Daybreak painted the forest in sickly hues. We were exposed, vulnerable. We decided to head back to the main road, get to higher ground where we could potentially catch a signal. We didn't make it far. There was a clearing just at the edge of the tree line. In the center of it, Simmons hung suspended ten feet off the ground. He was impaled through the chest on a massive wooden spike that jutted from the earth. It was fresh wood, like the tree had been ripped out, sharpened, and... I turned away, bow rising in my throat. Miller knelt, hands shaking, trying to reach for his med kit. Jensen was silent, a dangerous glint in his eyes. That thing's toying with us, he muttered. I'm gonna kill it. We tried moving around the clearing, but every path led back to its center, as if the forest itself was guiding us towards that grotesque display. The air grew heavier, oppressive. A snapping sound ripped through the trees. We spun in circles, rifles raised, adrenaline pounding in my ears. Then a massive shape fell from the canopy, landing between us and the clearing. It was the creature from the night before, in all its terrible glory. A towering giant, at least nine feet tall. It was gaunt, starved looking, skin stretched tight over bone. Its face, stretched almost like a dog's muzzle, full of elongated fangs. Long, clawed arms hung near its knees. Jensen didn't hesitate. He raised his rifle and opened fire. The bullets slammed into the creature. It jerked with every impact, but it kept coming. Miller pulled me back. Run! We ran. Blinded by panic, branches tearing at our faces, the sounds of the creature's relentless pursuit at our heels. Bursts of gunfire from Jensen echoed behind us, slowing further and further away, then stopping. Miller tripped and I crashed down with him, tumbling into a ditch. Holding my breath, I rolled underneath a tangle of roots and vines, dragging him with me. Silence fell around us. Not the peaceful silence of the forest, but the heavy, watchful silence of a predator. I strained my ears, listening for any sign of movement. Miller? I hissed. A faint groan came from beside me. Relief flooded me, but it was quickly replaced by guilt. We had abandoned Jensen. There was no way he survived that encounter. We had to get out of here, had to keep moving. I pressed my ear to the ground. Nothing. Maybe it was gone. Maybe it had lost our scent. 
hours of crawling, weaving through the dense undergrowth. The forest felt like it was closing in on us. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made me jump. We came across a dirt road, the first sign of civilization we had seen in what felt like forever. We followed it, hoping it would lead us out of this nightmare. We didn't speak. The weight of Jensen's death hung heavy between us. A noise up ahead. My hand tightened on my rifle. Relief washed over me when I saw the headlights of a truck approaching. It slowed as it drew closer, the driver peering out with a puzzled expression. Hey, boys, he called, a hint of suspicion in his voice. Y'all lost? We were a sight, covered in dirt and scratches, our eyes wild with exhaustion and a terror he probably couldn't comprehend. I managed to explain about the creature, faltering, stumbling over the words. It sounded insane even to myself. His expression shifted into one of amusement. Now I hear some tall tales in this neck of the woods, but that one takes the cake. Bigfoot? Aliens? Waddle it be next? It was futile. No one was going to believe us. I thanked him for the ride back into town and refused to answer any more questions. The local sheriff gave us similar treatment, concern mixed with thinly veiled mockery. They thought we were lost hikers, maybe a little rattled after a cougar scare. Back at the base, the debriefing went as expected. Skeptical faces, raised eyebrows. Disbelief hung heavy in the air. We were ordered to take two weeks' leave, mandatory psych evaluation scheduled. We were branded. We would forever be the crazy ones, the ones who saw things that didn't exist. We never saw the creature again, but I could feel it, lurking in the shadows. It had hunted us, played with us, and it could strike again, any time, anywhere. It knew who we were. It knew where to find us. For Miller, the damage was worse than the physical wounds. The nightmares stole his sleep. Whispers from the darkness filled his waking hours. He couldn't shake the image of Simmons, the feeling of helplessness, of being trapped. They said it was PTSD, but I knew it was something more. A year later, Miller took his own life. They cleaned out his locker, sent the standard condolences to his next of kin. Life at the base moved on as if he'd never existed. I'm still with the team, ten years later. We hunt the things the rest of the world doesn't believe in, the things the government knows damn well are real, even if they'll never admit it publicly. And every night, when I close my eyes, I see that clearing. Simmons hanging lifeless... Jensen's roar of defiance, and the creature's unblinking eyes staring out at us from the darkness. Jensen had been right. We were hunted, marked. Survivors? No. We were the living dead, our lives reduced to a countdown to the next encounter with the unknown. And the nightmares, they never really end. You just learn to live with them, the constant companions— Reminders that the darkness is vast, and the monsters lurking within, they are very real. Sometimes I wonder if they put us on leave on purpose back then. Did they already know about the creatures? Tendencies? Were we an experiment all along? A test to see how long we would last, how much we could endure before we broke. Those thoughts, they're the most terrifying of all. They hint at a truth far more disturbing than any monster lurking in the woods. That the shadows we fight, they might just be a part of us. My name is Ethan Carter, and this happened to me in October of 2015. I'm a hunter. You know the kind... Loves the outdoors, camo gear, the works. 
But that's not why I was in the backwoods of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. That was work. I'm part of a group. We call ourselves the Watchers. It sounds kind of cheesy, I know, but the name stuck. It's a government group, off the books, unofficial, deniable. We investigate the things no one else wants to admit exist. Cryptids. Bigfoot, werewolves, whatever bumps in the night people whisper about. Mostly, it's wild goose chases and hoaxes. So when this assignment came in, I figured it'd be more of the same. It started with a series of missing persons cases in and around the National Park. Nothing unusual for such a vast, remote area. Hikers get lost, accidents happen. But there was something off about these disappearances. No trace, no gear, no bodies, nothing like animals might have gotten to them. The locals started talking about Bigfoot, and yeah, we've looked into those sightings before, but this felt different. There were three of us sent out, me, Jackson, and our team leader, Harris. Harris was an ex-military man the textbook definition of a hard-ass. He'd seen things, you could tell just by looking into his eyes. Jackson was more my speed, a tech was who loved bad jokes and Star Trek a little too much. We set up base camp a few miles from the latest disappearance. The Olympic forest is dense, almost claustrophobic. It's beautiful in that primeval, unsettling way. I remember that first day, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I felt watched. For two days, we hiked trails, swept search grids, found nothing but old footprints and deer scat. Harris was getting impatient. Jackson was bored. We were all starting to believe this was another dead end. Then came night three. We'd made camp in a small clearing. Just after dusk, we heard it. There's no way to describe that sound. It was human-like, a cry, but twisted wrong. And the volume, it echoed through the trees like nothing I'd ever heard. Jackson swore under his breath. Even Harris looked shaken for a moment. He flipped on the radio and ordered all units in the area to converge on our location. We wouldn't be alone for long. That night stretched on forever. We huddled near the fire, rifles at the ready. Each crackle of the flames, each rustle of leaves had me jumping. Something was out there, circling us. I'm not a religious man, but I said a prayer or two. Just before dawn, Jackson whispered, Look! In the dim pre-light I saw it. A figure hunched under the heavy branches of a cedar, about a hundred yards away. Massive. Taller than any man. The way it moved was wrong, limbs too long, jerks and twitches unnatural for anything human. Harris raised his rifle. I hesitated. None of us knew what we were dealing with, but a gut feeling, that primal instinct, told me that firing would only make things worse. As if sensing us, it turned its head. Massive eyes shone in the gloom, reflecting the dying embers of our fire. Then, in a blur of movement that defied its size, it vanished into the trees. Reinforcements arrived as the sun broke. But there was no sign of the creature. No footprints, despite the soft ground. It seemed impossible for something that big to just vanish. We expanded the search, teams sweeping the forest for miles in every direction. Nothing. A week later, they called us back. We were pulled off the case just as suddenly as we'd been brought in. They gave us the standard debrief treatment signed the NDAs, promised not to talk, receive our sealed envelopes of payment. Harris refused his envelope, tore right into it, and stormed out. That was our cue to leave. Out in the parking lot, Jackson caught my eye. You saw it too, didn't you? He said in a low voice. That thing, it wasn't natural. 
I nodded. What do you think it was? Jackson started the engine, his eyes on the road ahead. I don't know. But you can bet we'll never find the answer in any official file. Months later, I can still feel its eyes on me in the dark. I dream of that clearing, that unearthly cry. The missing persons' cases in the Olympics went unsolved. I have no doubt the creature is still out there, lurking in those ancient forests, waiting. My name is Jason Cole, and this happened to me in September 2016. I'm the type most folks assume has a 9-to-5 office job and a mortgage. You wouldn't look at me and think I've seen the things I have. But I'm not the desk jockey type. I'm part of a team they keep in the shadows. The kind they call when the regular channels fail, when things go bump in the night, and no one else has the answers. We were called into Yellowstone National Park that summer. Series of bizarre animal deaths was the official explanation. Mutilated elk carcasses, drained of blood, no predator tracks in sight. Locals whispered about vampires, chupacabras, whatever horror their imaginations could conjure. My three-man crew knew the official explanation was always a smokescreen. Our team was me, the tracker, ex-military. Then there was Davis, tech guy. Glasses, wiry frame, genius in the lab. And Brooks, our leader. A man who, once you stripped away the crisp uniform, had eyes that had stared into the abyss way too many times. We got the full debrief at the local ranger station. Park officials were on edge. Yellowstone is their baby, and they hated admitting something was happening they couldn't explain. We didn't blame them. The truth we hunted? It wasn't the stuff of campfire stories. It was the stuff of nightmares. The first few days were routine. We swept suspected kill sites, collected samples, set cameras. Then everything changed. It began with a radio call, a panicked park ranger on the other end. I have eyes on it. Sector 3, near Old Faithful. It's... Christ, I don't know what it is. Requesting immediate backup. Davis swore, already scrambling for his gear. I felt a rush of adrenaline and a knot of dread twisting in my gut. This was it. This was what we had come for. We piled into the jeep, Davis navigating. He pinpointed the ranger's coordinates and we tore off down a dirt track. When we arrived at the scene, I'll admit my nerves were jangling tight enough to snap. Ranger Thompson was there, crouched behind his truck, pale as a ghost. Over there, he hissed, pointing a trembling finger towards the tree line. At first, all I saw were dark shadows. Then, a shape coalesced out of the gloom. Massive, at least eight feet tall at the shoulder, crouched like a predatory cat. As it stepped into the waning sunlight, I got a full view. Thick, matted fur, dark as midnight. A muzzle stretched too long, too many teeth flashing inside. Its limbs moved with an inhuman, sinuous power, like muscle and bone were molded from liquid. My training kicked in, Years of facing the unknown distilling into a single moment of clarity. Get Thompson out of here, Brooks barked to me. He and Davis already had their rifles up. The creature was advancing now. Not a mindless animal, but a predator with intelligence blazing in its eyes. Then, as if sensing their intentions, it turned and bolted back into the trees with blinding speed. Go! 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 Brooks roared. We chased that thing for hours. Davis tracked it on thermal, but it moved like a wraith, always one step ahead. Trails led us in circles, 
thermal signatures vanished and reappeared in impossible locations. It was playing with us, toying with its prey. The light was failing as we stumbled into a clearing and found our quarry waiting. Moonlight glittered on its fangs, reflecting in a dozen gleaming eyes scattered across its hide. Its mouth opened in a twisted mockery of a grin. Brooks raised his rifle. Davis fumbled with a grenade launcher, muttering prayers under his breath. It's changing, I croaked, the words snagging in my throat. The creature's form rippled, bones shifting beneath the thick fur. It quadrupled in size, sprouting extra limbs that sprouted its own eyes. A low growl, less animal than machine, vibrated through the clearing. And then it charged. The air filled with the roar of gunfire and explosions. Something huge and heavy bowled me over, knocking the breath from my lungs. I tasted blood. I scrambled for a weapon, for anything. Then nothing. Blackness. I woke up hours later, head throbbing. Brooks knelt beside me, his face etched with grim relief. Not far off, I saw Davis, his arm in a makeshift sling. The grenade, Brooks said, knocked it back, gave us time to retreat. Then his voice hardened. But it's still out there. We never got a clear shot. We tracked it for days, always a few steps behind. Finally, the order came from above, extraction. They were pulling us out. We left Yellowstone with the beast still roaming its forests, and the image of those eyes, too many eyes, burned into my mind. My name is Gabriel Rossi, and this happened to me in October of 2010. I'm a hunter, been one ever since my dad took me out into the woods when I was a kid. But I'm not the type who hunts for sport. My family, we run a wildlife preserve in the Adirondacks. We do things the hard way. Conservation, animal tracking, only taking out a problem predator if there's no other way. It's in my blood. That fall, something was wrong in the woods. We'd been getting reports of cattle mutilations from neighboring farms. Not coyotes, this was something bigger, more calculated. Then a hiker vanished from a trail near our land. Everyone blamed a bear, but bears leave a mess. This was clean, surgical. I knew deep down that the official story was wrong. It felt different. The kind of different that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. I decided to investigate myself, just one night out on the trails. My wife begged me not to go, but I couldn't shake the feeling. That night, I headed out with my rifle and an uneasy knot in my stomach. The Adirondacks at night are a different world. You hear every snap of a twig every rustle of leaves. A few hours passed, nothing. I was starting to think I was crazy when I saw it. A flicker of movement near the tree line. Moonlight glinted off something, an eye. Massive, yellow, and blazing with a chilling intelligence. My heart jackhammered in my chest as I raised my rifle. Before I could get off a shot, it moved. Just a blur of darkness, but fast, impossible speed. It circled me, silent as a ghost. I swung my rifle wildly, trying to get a clear shot, but it vanished as quickly as it appeared. My breath came in ragged gasps. Then I heard it. A low, rumbling growl, from everywhere and nowhere at once. I was surrounded. I didn't know how many there were but I knew I was outmatched. Panic edged in. This wasn't a bear, not a wolf. Whatever it was, it had been hunting me. I fired off a warning shot, more to break the terrifying silence than anything else. A chorus of howls erupted all around me. 
the hair stood up on my arms. I started backing away, scanning the darkness, trying to keep an eye on all directions at once. Then I saw a pair of eyes gleaming in the undergrowth. I fired. It let out a screech, a sound that ripped through the night like a rusty blade. But it didn't go down. It charged, moving on all fours, and in the dim light, I finally got a good look at it. It was canine, but warped. Too lanky, joints bending at unnatural angles. Skin stretched tight over bone, ribs protruding, like something starving. But the eyes, those eyes were full of a terrible cunning. I fired again. This time, I hit it. It stumbled then turned, limping off into the dense undergrowth. A trail of blood, glowing faintly in the moonlight, marked its path. I knew I should leave it, get back to the safety of home, but something compelled me to follow. I trailed the creature for what felt like hours. The blood stains led me deeper into the woods, the terrain getting rougher and wilder with each step. My instinct screamed at me to turn back, but there was a determination in me now. I had to see this through. Finally, the blood trail ended at a cave entrance, half hidden by overgrown vines. Darkness seeped out of it like thick smoke. I approached cautiously, rifle raised. My headlamp cut through the gloom, revealing the mangled remains of what must have been the missing hiker. A wave of nausea washed over me. I should have turned back then, but I steeled myself and pushed deeper into the cave. Inside, it was cramped, the smell of rotten flesh and damp earth almost overpowering. And then I saw them. The creatures were huddled together in the darkness. There were at least four of them, maybe more. Their skin was a mottled gray and their eyes reflected the dim light with a predatory hunger. One of their number had been injured, the one I had shot. The other snarled softly, the noise reverberating off the cave walls. I froze. There were too many. I had to get out of there. I slowly backed away, trying not to make a sound. I had almost reached the cave entrance when a low growl made me whirl around. The injured creature was blocking my exit. It moved with a deceptive limp, blood still dripping from its side. It stalked closer, teeth bared in a grotesque grin. I raised my rifle. I had one, maybe two shots before the others would be on me. I had to make it count. I took a deep breath, lined up my sights, and squeezed the trigger. The gunshot echoed deafeningly in the confined space. The creature let out a yelp and collapsed, but the rest were roused. They charged. My finger frantically pumped the action, ejecting the spent shell. I aimed at the next closest creature, but it was already leaping through the air towards me. Pain exploded in my shoulder as its claws raked across my flesh. I stumbled backwards, slammed into the cave wall. The rifle slipped from my grasp, clattering against the rocks. The creature lunged again, but this time I was ready. I dodged to the side, and it stumbled past me, crashing into the cave wall with a startled hiss. I scrambled for my rifle, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm in my chest. Then, another blur of motion. One of the creatures flanked me, slamming me to the ground. The world tilted crazily, stars exploding in my vision. Claws tore at my clothing, my skin, searching for a purchase. I roared in defiance, a primal scream of panic and fury. I thrash, bucking the creature off me with more desperation than strength. It yelled, taken aback for a moment. Just enough time. I scrambled for the rifle, the world tilting dizzily. Blind instinct took over as I swung the barrel up, slamming the buttstock into the creature's muzzle. It recoiled with a whimper. There was a blinding flash of light, 
and a deafening roar as I squeezed the trigger. Bone and blood exploded outwards. The other two were circling, wary now. I snatched up the rifle and stumbled to my feet, my vision blurring. Blood streamed down my face, stinging my eyes. Rossi! Rossi, what the hell is going on? A voice cut through the roaring in my ears. Blinded by blood and the dim headlamp, I couldn't tell where it was coming from. Who's there? I shouted, adrenaline masking the tremor in my voice. Hold your fire, Rossi. This is Special Agent Walker. The voice was cut short by a strangled scream. Then, more gunshots, echoing weirdly against the cave walls. I swung wildly, trying to pinpoint the source of the attack. The flash of a muzzle and I fired on instinct. A howl ripped through the air, followed by the sound of something retreating into the shadows. Silence descended, punctuated by labored breathing and the dripping of blood. I slumped against the cave wall, suddenly drained of strength. Then, searchlights cut through the darkness. Armed men in tactical gear swarmed into the cave. At their center was a tall, imposing figure, a man with hard features and a no-nonsense demeanor. Walker, if my blood-blurred vision could be trusted. Secure the perimeter, he barked. Medic, we have an injured civilian. Two medics hurried over to me, hands moving with practiced efficiency. Through the haze of pain and shock, I registered more men dragging out the bodies of the creatures. The acrid tang of their blood hung heavy in the air. Walker approached me. His eyes were cold and calculating. What the hell happened here, Rossi? The words spilled out of me, a jumbled account of the hunt, the creatures, the attack. Walker listened, his expression unchanging, a hard mask of disbelief. When I was done, he took a deep breath. Welcome to the real world, Mr. Rossi, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Embrace yourself, because things are about to get a whole lot stranger. The next few weeks were a blur. The medics patched me up as best they could. I was questioned relentlessly by Walker, by other suited men who never gave their names. The story never changed. They found the rest of the creature's den more mutilated animal carcasses, and the remains of other victims, hikers who had vanished over the years. My story was never released to the public. Officially, it was ruled a bear attack, a cover-up designed to avoid mass panic. My wife was furious, but Walker's men were persuasive, a mix of veiled threats and promises of compensation. My role in it all was erased, buried. Instead, I was recruited. Walker's team, they weren't FBI or park rangers. They were something else. A group dedicated to hunting the things most people think only exist in nightmares. I had seen the truth, and there was no going back to a normal life. The years since have been filled with missions. Hushed up incidents, glimpses of creatures lurking in the shadows of our world. Most of the time, I manage to convince myself this is the right path, that the things out there, they're monsters. But in the quiet moments, late at night when sleep evades me, I remember the intelligence in those glowing eyes, the uncanny way they hunted, stalked. And I wonder, what if they're not monsters? What if we are? There's no going back now. My wife... She never fully understood what happened that night, why I was never the same. We drifted apart. I see her sometimes, when I can arrange a visit back to the Adirondacks. She has a new life, a family. She deserves happiness. As for me, I have the missions, the constant vigilance. It's a life lived walking a razor's edge. The scars on my shoulder ache in the damp. I keep track of the missing persons reports from the Adirondack region, wondering if maybe, just maybe, 
A few of them weren't random accidents or animal attacks after all. My name is Ben Mason, and this happened to me in August of 2014. I've spent most of my life working outdoors. First as a park ranger, then in fire management in the sprawling forests of Oregon. The work is tough but honest. Now I'm part of something more, something you won't find on any government website. It started with the wildfires. A devastating season in the Rogue River Siskiyou Wilderness, one of the most rugged, remote stretches left in the lower 48. We were told to expect the usual issues aggressive wildlife displaced by the flames. But on the fire lines, there was something else, something watching us from the charred tree lean. Rangers whispered stories about sightings of figures, too tall, too fast to be any animal. Reports trickled up to my unit. Officially, they were dismissed as stress-induced hallucinations. I wasn't so sure. A few weeks after things had calmed down, I got the call. A summons to a compound deep in the forest, disguised as an old logging camp. That's where I met the others. There was Jenner, ex-military, as hard and silent as the rifle he carried. There was Torres, a tech was armed with more electronic gadgets than a spy movie. And leading us was Walker, a no-nonsense man with eyes that had witnessed things that would shatter most people's sanity. We were officially designated a Wildlife Incident Response Team, a cover story for the public. But the truth we hunted was something else entirely. Cryptids, creatures of folklore, the things people whisper about around campfires. And with the rash of sightings during those wildfires, the higher-ups couldn't risk ignoring the possibility anymore. Our first assignment brought us back to the wilds of the Siskiyou. A lone hiker had been reported missing days earlier, no trace. Search parties had scoured the area and found nothing. The terrain was rough, easy to disappear into if you didn't know what you were doing, but this hiker was experienced. We went deeper than the search teams had dared pushing through dense undergrowth. Walker scanned the scorched ground for tracks while Jenner silently watched our backs. The forest here seemed unnaturally quiet. Then Torres stopped, his brow furrowed. Thermal anomaly, thirty yards out. He muttered, his eyes fixed on a tablet. Something big. We followed his pointing finger, rifles raised towards a stand of blackened trees. At the base of the largest tree, a cave mouth gaped at us like a ragged wound in the earth. Walker made a swift hand motion, and we spread out, approaching cautiously. The smell hit us first, a rotten, metallic tang I'd never encountered before. Torres peered into the darkness, the skin of his thermal equipment casting an eerie red glow across his face. It's in here, he whispered. Then, a noise from the depths, low, guttural, like nothing human. We tensed. Suddenly, it burst from the cave entrance, a blur of dark fur and gleaming teeth. We barely had time to react before it snatched up Torres and dragged him screaming into the shadows. Gunfire erupted. Jenner and I blindly shot into the darkness flashes illuminating the cavern walls and the creature's hulking form. It moved impossibly fast, even burdened by Torres' limp body. A roar of pain, then, silence. We rushed forward, flashlights cutting through the gloom. At first, all we saw was a trail of splattered blood leading deeper into the cave. Torres! Walker called out, his voice ragged. There was no reply, only the relentless drip of water echoing in the darkness. We exchanged grim looks. We had to go after him. We ventured into the cave, rifles at the ready, 
the damp earth chilling beneath our feet. The tunnel wound deeper, narrowing until we were forced to crouch. The air grew thick and musty. Then we saw the glow, twin points of reflected light ahead. Our beams swept upwards, revealing a massive creature hunched in a large, hollowed-out chamber. It was at least eight feet tall at the shoulder, crouched on powerful haunches. Coarse, black fur covered its body, and the eyes, reflecting the light, burned with a chilling, predatory intelligence. It clutched Tora's lifeless body in one clawed hand, taking ravenous bites. Blood was splattered all over the cave floor. For a moment, we froze, paralyzed by a primal fear. This thing was beyond any of our training, any experience out in the wild. Then Walker's voice cut through the terrified silence. Fire! We let loose a volley of shots. The creature screeched in fury, dropping Torres' mangled body. It lunged, moving with shocking speed despite its bulk. We retreated, scrambling backwards, barely avoiding its thrashing claws. The thing stalked us through the tunnels, its roar reverberating against the rock walls. We fired wildly, more out of desperation than hope, the confined space amplifying the deafening gunshot blasts. Luck, blind, frantic luck, was our only salvation. A few bullets found their mark, striking the creature. Icor, thick and black, oozed from the wounds, stinging our nostrils with its acrid stench. Enraged, the creature charged, slamming into the tunnel wall with bone-jarring force. Rocks tumbled down, and for a horrible second, I thought the entire cave was about to collapse on us. We pushed deeper, reaching a fork in the tunnels. Split up! Walker yelled, already sprinting down the left branch. Jenner and I took the right, our boots splashing through puddles of chilling underground water. Panic fueled our flight, pushing us on despite the burning pain in our lungs. Behind us, a crash echoed, followed by a frustrated howl. Walker had let it off our trail. We exchanged a grim look of understanding. He was buying us time. A surge of adrenaline propelled us onwards. We burst out of the cave system into the blinding daylight. The Siskiyou foothills sprawled around us, lush and deceptively peaceful. We collapsed to the ground, sucking in great gulps of fresh air. Above us, a helicopter appeared, its rotors churning the air. Walker's face appeared in the doorway, drawn and tight with tension. He gestured urgently for us to board. As we hauled ourselves into the copter, I risked a look over my shoulder. The trees below seemed to tremble, but the creature didn't emerge. Back at the compound, it was a blur of debriefings, medical tests, and grim silences. We didn't speak of Torres or of Walker's sacrifice. It was an unspoken agreement, a way to keep what sanity we had left. Instead, we pored over the data, the sensor readouts, the tattered remains of Torres' equipment. The creature was big, fast, incredibly strong. It had an almost uncanny ability to avoid our thermal detection. And it was smart. In the weeks that followed, the creature became an obsession. The images of Torres' mangled body were burned into my retinas. The mission reports I submitted were meticulously detailed, fueled by a desire for both understanding and revenge. They sent us out again, back into the wilds. We tracked the creature, a ghost in the forests. It was always one step ahead, leaving behind only the occasional bloody carcass and a palpable sense of being watched, hunted. We laid traps, sophisticated ones, designed with Torres' salvage tech. Weeks went by. Nothing. It was starting to feel like either the creature had moved on or, more chillingly, that it was smarter than any trap we could devise. Then, a glimmer of hope. 
a ranger reported an unusual sighting on the other side of the Siski Range. Grainy camera footage showed a massive dark shape, hulking and bipedal. We were dispatched immediately. Arriving at the location carved a fresh knot of dread into my gut. This place had the same unnerving stillness as the other sites the creature visited. We deployed the new trap, an electrified net that Torres had designed before, before. And we waited. Days stretched into sleepless nights. The forest seemed to watch our every move. One morning... The silence was broken by the whine of the net's power surge, followed by a bone-rattling roar of fury. We raced towards the sound. There, thrashing against the restraints of the net, was the creature. It looked even more monstrous in the unforgiving daylight, its claws raking at the net, its teeth gnashing. I raised my rifle. This was it. Revenge. Closure an end to the constant lurking fear. Jenner was beside me, his own rifle leveled, his hand steady. Then, Walker's voice blared on the radio. Hold your fire. I repeat, hold your fire. Confusion and anger surged inside me. Didn't he see what this thing had done? What it had taken? Then the creature did something unexpected. It stopped struggling its gleaming eyes fixed directly on us. It wasn't the mindless fury of a cornered animal. It was intelligence. Calculation. Walker reached us first, his face unreadable. At his side were two civilians, a man and woman dressed in suits that screamed, Government. We're taking over from here, the man declared. His voice was sharp, authoritative, brooking no argument. Taking over? Jenner snarled. We've been tracking this thing. Stand down, soldier. The woman snapped. Your mission is terminated. We could only watch, helpless fury choking us, as agents swarmed the site. They sedated the creature, loaded it into a reinforced vehicle, and vanished back into the forest. We weren't given answers, only vague orders to pack up camp and report for new assignments. The questions burned inside me. Why intervene? What did the government want with the creature? Walker gave us nothing, leaving us with a lingering sense of betrayal on top of our grief and frustration. The aftermath is something I live with every day. I see Torres' face whenever I close my eyes. I walk on trails looking over my shoulder. They transferred me to the East Coast, as far from the Siskius as they could. A desk job now, pushing papers on threats I'm not allowed to fight. I hear about sightings, reports that sound hauntingly familiar. They keep those hidden from public view, swept under official rugs. And the creature? It's out there, or in a lab somewhere and every day I wonder, what are they doing to it? And what, or who, is next? My name is Carter Hayes, and this happened to me in September 2009. I worked as a wildlife biologist in Yellowstone National Park. Most days were filled with data tracking, trail maintenance, routine stuff. But there's a wildness to Yellowstone that seeps into your bones, a sense of something vast and untamed, and watching. It started with the mauled carcasses. Elk, mostly, but the way they were taken down wasn't right. Not wolves, not a bear. Something else— something that left the park rangers scratching their heads and muttering under their breath about things old as the park itself. Whispers reached my ears, stories told by campers on the fringes of the park, of glimpses of something massive moving through the trees. They dismissed them as tall tales fueled by too many nights by the campfire. Yet, standing alone in the dense forest, 
surrounded by the mutilated remains of creatures I thought I knew, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. Then came the disappearances. A lone hiker on a backcountry trail vanished without a trace. Then two more. The official statement from the park was animal attacks, but the lack of any remains told a different story. Panic spread, and my quiet job suddenly thrust me into the heart of a full-blown manhunt. Word must have gotten up the chain because one morning a government jeep pulled up to my cabin. Inside were two men who didn't bother with park service uniforms. Their names were Mason and Reeves, and they cut to the chase. They were part of a special team brought in to handle the disappearances. And they wanted me to guide them. For three days, we traversed the wilderness. Mason, ex-military, all hard muscle and hard eyes. Reeves, a lean, nervous type who was more at home hunched over computers than the great outdoors. And me, suddenly thrust into a world I'd never imagined despite a lifetime spent in the wilds. We tracked the coordinates of the most recent disappearance. The hiker, a young woman, had been broadcasting her location via a tracking app. Her trail ended abruptly at the base of a dense, overgrown valley known to the locals as No Man's Hollow. It had an ominous ring for a reason. Old-timers claimed anyone who wandered in there didn't come out. The terrain was brutal, strewn with fallen trees, dense thickets. The GPS led us to a trampled campsite. The woman's pack lay torn open, but there was no sign of blood, no struggle. I led them deeper into the hollow, my steps hesitant. The air seemed to grow thicker, heavier, and an unnatural silence pressed in around us. Suddenly, Reeves shouted, pointing ahead. Wedged between two rocks was the woman's phone, crushed but still functional. He held it up, the cracked screen showing a blurry, pixelated image, the last thing the camera had captured before its destruction. We crowded close, our hearts pounding. The photo was grainy, half obscured by foliage. Yet it was enough to make our blood run cold. Staring back at us was no animal. It was a massive, bipedal shape, impossibly tall, hunched in the shadows. It had long, muscular limbs, and a glint of eyes that burned with chilling intelligence. What the hell is that? Reeves hissed, his voice barely a whisper. Before anyone could answer, a scream echoed through the hollow. Not a human scream, but something deeper, wilder. There was only one source, the woman. She's still alive, I hissed. We have to find her. We charged into the undergrowth, following the sound. I caught glimpses of the creature through the trees. It moved with unnatural speed, more innate than a man, but far larger than anything I'd ever encountered. The pursuit led us deeper into the heart of No Man's Hollow, the ground growing steeper, rockier. We reached a sheer cliff, at its base, a cave entrance. And on the ground outside was the woman's torn and bloody t-shirt. Mason made the call. We're going in. Fear twisted my guts, but a primal determination overrode it. We drew our weapons, flashlights cutting through the gloom of the cave. The air was thick with a humid, earthy stench. Each step forward felt like walking into a predator's den. Then, a noise from deeper inside the cave, a low guttural growl. It echoed back at us, multiplied, as if the creature knew we were here. We tensed, weapons raised. From the darkness, it launched itself at us. A blur of fur, teeth, and claws. Reeves screamed and fired his rifle blindly. The creature was upon us, its roar deafening in the confined space. Mason unleashed a volley of shots, striking the creature and driving it back. But as it retreated, it snatched up Reeves in its massive, clawed hand. Reeves screamed again, 
His cries cut short as the creature vanished back into the darkness with its prize. His rifle clattered to the cave floor. His flashlight rolled across the rocks, the beam trembling wildly before going dark. Reeves! Mason and I scrambled forward, but there was nothing in the darkness but an echoing silence. Fury surged through me. These things had been lurking in the park, preying on people, and now they had one of our own. Mason held up a hand, the universal sign to pause and listen. Silence hung in the air. Then, faintly, we heard a rustling, a muffled whimper from deeper within the cave system. Mason nodded at me, his eyes grim beneath the low beam of his flashlight. We were going after Reeves. The cave tunnels wound downwards, the air growing denser and the foul stench intensifying. We stalked forward, rifles raised, our flashlights cutting through the suffocating blackness. The whimpers grew louder, urging us on. Suddenly, we burst into a large natural cavern, the ceiling studded with dimly luminescent rock formations. And there, chained to the far wall with thick metal chains, was Reeves. He was slumped in a corner, ragged breaths heaving from his chest. He was alive, but his eyes were vacant with terror. Before we could react, the creature reappeared, dropping from the ceiling in a flurry of darkness and claws. Mason opened fire, forcing it back. I sprinted towards Reeves, ignoring the enraged screeching, the glint of teeth. The chains were heavy, secured with a thick padlock. My fingers fumbled for my tool kit, desperately searching for the bolt cutters. Time seemed to stretch, each tick of the second a hammer blow to my nerves. The creature stalked closer, circling us. A single swipe of its claws would tear me apart. Mason kept it pinned with a relentless barrage of gunfire, forcing it back again and again. With a gasp of triumph, I snapped the padlock, and the chains fell away. I half-dragged, half-carried Reeves as we made a desperate scramble back towards the cave entrance. The echoing gunshots and the creature's howls of rage fueled our flight. We burst back into the light of day, collapsing beside the cliff. Mason slammed the heavy stone that served as a makeshift door shut behind us, barring the entrance. Silence fell save for our ragged breaths and Reeves' ragged sobs. We'd escaped, but at a terrible cost. I looked down at no man's hollow, now bathed in the soft glow of sunset. It felt like the wilderness itself was staring back accusingly. The aftermath was a whirlwind. More soldiers arrived, armed to the teeth. They sealed off the entire area. We were debriefed in a hastily erected field camp, our descriptions of the creature met with stony-faced nods. It was clear they knew more than they were letting on. We never went back inside that cave. A week later, a controlled detonation was ordered. The muffled blast echoed through the valley, followed by an ominous silence. When I asked what they'd found, Mason just looked at me and said, We found enough. The incident was hushed up. The missing hikers were ruled as unfortunate wildlife encounters. No mention was made of the creature, of the cave, of Reeves. Officially, he never existed. For Mason and me, there was no going back to a normal life. We'd seen the shadows in the park, the things lurking beyond the flickering edges of civilization. We were recruited into a new unit its existence hidden behind layers of government bureaucracy. We became hunters of the unknown, tracking creatures most people dismissed as myth. They sent us into remote corners of the country, places where unexplained sightings and disappearances made the news, then were promptly forgotten. I've faced horrors I never could have imagined, stared into eyes that hold no trace of humanity. It's a solitary life, spent on the fringes of society. Mason jokes that we're the real monsters, 
out there in the darkness. He's not entirely wrong. Sometimes, I look in the mirror and don't recognize the man staring back at me. The worst part isn't the creatures we hunt. It's the knowledge of how much more lurks out there, the things the government knows about and keeps hidden. The world most people see is just a thin veneer, and beneath it, well, let's just say I don't tell campfire stories anymore. There's always a new trail to follow, some new mystery in the heart of forgotten wilderness. I tell myself I do this to protect people, but another part of me knows I'm searching for something. Absolution, maybe? Or perhaps, deep down, part of me believes that one day I'll wander into some godforsaken corner of the world and find Reeves. Alive. Unlikely, I know. But out in the places where the wild things dwell, hope is a rare and precious thing. You have to cling to it. Or you might end up like the creatures you hunt. My name is Ezekiel Barnes, and this happened to me on October 6, 2003. I'm ex-military, the kind they tap for things the regular grunts shouldn't see. These days, that means hunting the unnatural for a government branch most folks swear is an urban legend. My wife laughs, calls it my spooky ghostbuster gig. She doesn't know half of it, and that's how it's gotta stay. This mess started with a whisper about disappearances in the Pisgah National Forest, North Carolina. Deep woods, Appalachian folklore thicker than the undergrowth. Vanished hunters, hikers, even a park ranger. Locals assumed mishaps, wildlife attacks. My gut said otherwise. See, I've learned that when the whispers line up, the fairy tales are often just misunderstood reality. Base camp was a converted ranger station. I met my team, Dr. Wells, a biologist with eyes that saw too much, and Carter, a tactical guy who could have been a poster for Black Ops. We spent the first day digging through old reports, missing person files. The usual, bad weather, bad luck, and bad choices add up to tragedy. Except for a few nagging things, wounds that didn't fit any known predator, accounts of shadows that moved wrong. Day two, we hit the trails Pisgah feels ancient, the trees closing in like they hold grudges. I focused on the ground, reading the signs a good tracker sees. Broken branches, crushed foliage, but one thing missing, a struggle. Most animal attacks leave a mess. These disappearances were surgical, like whoever did it knew exactly what they wanted. Wells found the first signs that evening. Fragments of clothing snagged high up on a branch, and a smear of blood on a tree trunk too big to be human. Then, we smelled it, rot mixed with a strange, oily musk. We exchanged looks. This wasn't just a scavenger cleaning up remains. This was the hunter's scent. Night fell hard. We holed up in a camouflaged blind, the tech buzzing around us like angry hornets. Suddenly, Wells hissed, pointing at the infrared monitor. A shape emerged from the black, huge, bulky, moving with an unnatural sway. Even the blurry image sent shivers down my spine. Something shifted in the air. A high-pitched wail cracked through the silence, like a child screaming in pain, only magnified a hundred times. That was when it attacked. Carter yelled a warning. The blind buckled as a massive weight slammed against the side. Fabric tore, metal shrieked. Carter fired, the muzzle flashes lighting up a monstrous shape. Humanoid yet twisted, legs bent back like a spider's, and eyes that glowed with a hellish yellow light. It roared, a mix of fury and hunger, and swatted at Carter with a scarred, clawed hand. Carter stumbled back and Wells lunged forward, not with a gun, but a taser. 
Twin barbs hit the creature's flesh, sending a jolt that shook the ground. It shrieked again, an ear-splitting sound, then turned its glowing eyes on Wells. What happened next defied all logic. Wells stood stock still, face blank. The creature lunged, not for a killing blow, but grabbing Wells and dragging her screaming into the darkness. Carter and I were left staring at the torn tent, the fading scream. We fired blindly into the night but heard only the echo of our own gunshots. First light found us scrambling through the underbrush, following a trail of blood and fabric that stopped abruptly at a ravine. Wells was gone, just a shred of her coat in the bushes. No body, no tracks of the creature. Just a gaping void where she'd stood. Carter broke radio silence, voice taught. Evac arrived, along with a whole new team of specialists. I went through the motions, debrief, psych eval, the whole nine yards. They poked and prodded, looking for signs I'd snapped. What they don't get is, we're past that, past rational fear. See, out in those woods, I faced something outside the rules of our world. Now it's not about solving a mystery or even about catching the damned thing. This is primal now. This is about making sure whatever took Wells doesn't take anyone else. My name is Lucas Thorne, and this happened to me on July 22, 1995. I was a firefighter back then, the kind of guy who ran into burning buildings while everyone else ran out. Adrenaline junkie, maybe a touch reckless. Turns out, useful skills when you end up chasing things that aren't on any wildlife chart. This mess didn't start with fangs or fire. It started with a call about a domestic dispute in the bad part of St. Louis, the kind cops dreaded even in daylight. Me? I figure everyone deserves help when things go sideways. We rolled up to a grimy old house, the lights inside flickering like a bad horror movie. My partner, Johnson, took the back door, and I kicked in the front. The inside of the place looked like a war zone. Furniture overturned, holes punched through the walls, blood splatters everywhere. But no bodies... No sign of struggle beyond the chaos. A noise echoed from upstairs, a harsh, choking sound. We crept up, guns drawn, the floorboards groaning under our boots. The sounds led to the master bedroom. Slowly, I eased the door open. It was like somebody took nightmares and made them flesh. The man, hell, I don't know if I could call him that anymore, was huge, muscle contorted under papery skin. He moved jerkily, as if his own body were unfamiliar. Worst of all were the eyes, bloodshot, rolled back in his head, fixated on a corner of the room where there was nothing at all. The man lunged at me with a guttural roar, speed I wouldn't have thought possible. I fired before I even thought, the shots echoing in the small room. He jerked, stumbled, but kept on coming. I could see the holes in his chest leaking a thin, blackish fluid, but he paid them no mind. Johnson barged an in, grabbing my arm and dragging me backward. We tumbled down the stairs and scrambled out the front door, my ears ringing with gunshots and something shrieking that raised the hair on my neck. Barricading the front door bought us seconds. I heard the crashing of wood, saw the monstrous face appear in the shattered window frame, those awful eyes searching. Then, as suddenly as it started, it retreated, the shrieks receding into the summer heat. Shaking, we called it in. Cops, ambulances, the whole circus descended. They found the house trashed, blood stains everywhere, but no sign of the man-turned-monster. Johnson and I got chewed out, questioned until our teeth ached, then sent home on mandatory leave. 
Nobody believed what we saw. I started doing my own digging. Talked to old priests, folks steeped in urban legends, anyone on the fringes. Turns out, the pattern fit, sudden fits of rage, inhuman strength, sightings of things nobody could quite pin down. The deeper I looked, the clearer it became. St. Louis had a problem the official guidebooks didn't acknowledge. The fire department didn't want two guys with PTSD delusions, so I quit. Reconnected with a few buddies from the Marines, guys who wouldn't flinch at the unexplainable. Johnson, he couldn't handle the whispers, what he'd seen. Vanished. Probably thinks I'm crazy too. It's a different kind of fight these days. No fire hoses, no axes. It's loading up the van with enough firepower to level a city block, checking police reports for things that don't fit, chasing shadows most folks pretend aren't real. Some nights, I lie awake wondering what happened to Johnson, if those eyes from the window will ever find me. But mostly, I think about the other folks out there, the ones who will stumble into the darkness unprepared. Thing is, somebody's got to stand between them and the monsters. May as well be me. My name is Rowan Hayes, and this happened to me on February 16, 2012. Most folks think working for the Park Service means handing out maps maybe chasing off the occasional drunk camper. Turns out, reality's got more teeth. I was tracking a spike in bear complaints in Yellowstone, figuring some idiot tourist left a cooler out. What I found, well, it changed everything. Now, I'm not the kind to believe in Bigfoot and UFOs, right? But the reports got weird. Half-eaten deer, tracks bigger than any grizzly, and this smell witnesses described as rotten eggs mixed with wet fur. Something was out there, something big, and it wasn't playing by the rules. My supervisor thought I was nuts when I requested reinforcements and specialized gear. Washington, in their infinite wisdom, sent me Dr. Whitaker, a biologist with zero field experience, soft as a marshmallow, and smelling way too strongly of fancy cologne whatever. My job was to keep him alive and get answers. We tracked the thing for days. Broken branches led us off the marked trails, deeper into the thick forest where even the sunlight seemed afraid to tread. I found the carcass first. A full-grown elk, not eaten, but ripped apart like a chew toy. Torn flesh, shattered bones, and blood sprayed across the trees like some kind of twisted Jackson Pollock painting. Whitaker turned pale, stammering out something about undocumented predator behavior. He was still taking photos of the carnage when I heard it, a rustling from the tree line, followed by a low growl that set my teeth on edge. That's when it stepped out of the shadows. I'll try, but words fail. It was like a bear and a man got caught in a blender and came out, wrong. Massive, standing almost eight feet tall, covered in matted fur that stank of decay. Its eyes. Lord, the eyes were the worst. Yellow slits in a face stretched into a permanent, agonized scream. Whitaker shrieked, dropped his camera, and scrambled backward. My training kicked in. I yelled for Whitaker to run, raised my rifle, and squeezed the trigger. The shots cracked through the silent forest, and the creature staggered. I swore I saw tufts of fur fly, but it kept coming, roaring its fury. I fired again and again until my rifle clicked dry. The monster was close enough that I could smell its foul breath, see the individual strands of coarse hair on its arms. It lunged, a clawed hand the size of a trash can lid swiping at me. I ducked, the claws tearing through my backpack. Whitaker screamed again, but this time it was cut short. 
I spun the half-empty pack a clumsy weapon in my hands, in time to see Waker disappear into the trees, the creature's hulking form close behind. Then silence. Only the echo of Whitaker's final scream, the rustling leaves, and my ragged breaths. I called his name, my voice catching in my throat. No answer. I knew deep down there wouldn't be. I reported the incident, the attack, Whitaker's death. Park Security, FBI, the whole alphabet soup descended on Yellowstone. They found the shredded remains of my pack, traces of blood, not a single sign of Whitaker or the creature. My story got me labeled unreliable, shuffled to a desk job. Folks say I was lucky. Maybe they're right. But at night, I see those yellow eyes, hear the crunch of bone and Whitaker's scream. And I know damn well, lucky, isn't the word I'd use. The file on the Yellowstone incident is sealed tighter than a drum. They wrote it off as an animal attack, maybe a rogue grizzly. Me? I know what I saw. It wasn't natural, wasn't supposed to exist. And someplace deep in those woods, I bet it's still out there, waiting. Sometimes, I dream about going back, hunting it down. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe it's the only way to make the nightmare stop. My name is Elias Kane, and this happened to me on October 12, 2009. Folks think I retired from the military and work security at some boring office park. The truth? Let's just say the things that give normal people nightmares are my job description. The incident, as the higher-ups call it, started with a missing person report in the Ozarks. Nothing new there. Hikers get lost, meth heads do stupid things in the woods, accidents happen. Except this time, the local sheriff found something, off. Half-eaten camper, tent shredded, blood in places it shouldn't be. And the kicker, three-toed footprints, massive, like nothing he'd ever seen. My team got deployed three days later. Five of us, me, Jackson, a weapons expert who could make a tank out of toothpicks, Torres, tracker with a nose like a bloodhound, Doc Martin, medic and skeptic, and Davis, tech guy, greener than grass. We went in heavy, loaded with enough firepower to take down a bear platoon and high-tech sensors that made my first tour look like the Stone Age. The Ozarks in autumn are beautiful if you ignore the gnawing feeling that something else is out there. We followed the trail left by the sheriff, the trees closing in like a cage. The first day turned up nothing but shredded foliage and the occasional, unnerving silence. That night, the woods came alive with sounds that sent shivers down my spine, rustling leaves, snaps of distant branches, and once, a low growl that made even Jackson turn white. Day two. Torres found another campsite, similarly trashed. Doc Martin, brave soul that he was, poked around the remains, calling out theories about rabid wildlife and mass hysteria. I saw the doubt flicker in his eyes, though, the way he avoided looking into the shadows of the forest. Night fell like a hammer. We set up a perimeter, night vision buzzing green in our eyes. Davis fiddled with the sensors, muttering about zero readings, when the air split with a shriek that could curdle blood. The tech went flying as something massive crashed through the trees, a blur of muscle and rage. I fired, followed by a chorus of gunshots and shouts. The ground shook under the creature's weight. It was built like a man, but twisted, skin tight over two sharp bones. Its eyes glowed amber in the darkness, filled with a savage hunger. It snarled, revealing rows of jagged teeth. Torres yelled, a spray of blood painting his face. He went down clutching his mangled leg. 
We dragged him back, firing blindly as the creature circled us. In the chaos, Davis fumbled with a grenade, the pin slipping out with a soft click. He swore and lunged for it. The last thing I saw of him was his desperate dive toward the hissing metal. Then the world exploded in white heat. The blast threw us back. My ears rang, my vision swam. Through the smoke, I saw the creature stagger, its roar choked off. Torres screamed, his ruined legs smoking where the shrapnel hit. Jackson swore and dragged me to my feet, his face streaked with blood. Doc Martin was gone. I liked to think it was quick. We ran. I don't remember much. The pounding of my heart, Torres' ragged breaths, the maddening rustle of something tracking us through the trees. Burst out of the forest at dawn, half dead and leaving a trail of blood straight to the creature's den. The brass were all over us within hours. Medical debriefings, the stern-faced men in suits asking questions, hinting at cover-ups. Torres lost his leg. Jackson got sent to some psych ward, never quite recovered. Me, they patched up and sent back to the shadows. Officially, the Ozark incident was a bear attack, freak accident. Davis, they said, was a casualty of friendly fire. The nightmares they can't sanitize, the way the silence of empty woods makes my skin crawl, that's a burden I bear alone. Some nights, I dream of going back. Not to kill the creature there's a line even I won't cross but to look it in the eye, to let it know we're still out here, still fighting. Even monsters have to fear something. My name is Rick Slater, and this happened to me back in 2001. It was my first year on the job, fresh out of the academy. You might find it hard to believe, but if I'm being honest, I still have a tough time processing it myself sometimes. The official title is Special Cryptid Investigations Unit, but most folks who know about us just call us Monster Hunters. Pretty straightforward, all things considered. We're a hush-hush branch of the government, called in when local law enforcement hits a dead end on those unexplainable cases. You know the ones, cattle mutilations, hiker disappearances, strange sightings in the woods. That's where we step in. This incident took me to Oregon. A string of missing persons reports all centered around a small town nestled in the foothills of the Cascade Range. Folks were vanishing without a trace poof gone. The local cops were stumped, especially since the disappearances didn't fit any usual pattern. Hikers, sure, accidents happen. But there was also the elderly woman who went missing from her porch swing in broad daylight and the teenager last seen walking home from school who never made it through the front door. I was teamed up with two other agents, Mike Harris and Sarah Thompson. Mike was the old-timer, a weathered veteran with a gruff voice and eyes that had seen too many things to be truly at ease anymore. Sarah was sharp as a tack, ex-military, and the only one of the three of us who never flinched when things got weird. We rolled into town under the guise of National Park Service representatives. You learn pretty quickly in this business that discretion is your best weapon. This town was hurting. Everyone knew someone who had gone missing. There was a tension in the air, a sense of lurking fear. Our first stop was the sheriff's office. Sheriff Davis was a tired-looking man with deep lines etched on his face. He'd been leading the investigation into the disappearances, and the frustration gnawed at him. I appreciate the help, but don't expect any miracles, he warned us, pushing a stack of case files across the desk. We've gone over this with a fine-tooth comb. There just ain't nothing to go on. We spent the next few days interviewing witnesses. 
or rather, people with little to offer except speculation and terror. One woman tearfully described a shadow bigger than a bear, moving through the trees near her house the night before her husband disappeared. A gas station attendant spoke of a rank smell like rotting meat hanging over a van that one of the missing persons had been seen driving. Bits and pieces, nothing to shape into a coherent picture. The break in the case came with a shaky 911 call from a hunter out in the dense part of the forest. He claimed to have found something, stumbled on a, well, it wasn't clear exactly what he'd found. Only that it wasn't good. We loaded up the jeep with field gear, the kind not issued to your average park ranger, and followed his directions deep into the woods. That's when things started to feel off. I'm not talking about spooky vibes. It was an instinct, the honed sense of a predator sizing up its surroundings. The hair on the back of my neck prickled. Mike and Sarah shared uneasy glances. Everyone felt it. The hunter, a burly fellow named Chuck, was waiting for us at a trailhead, his face pale. He led us further into the trees, the undergrowth thick and clinging. Finally, he stopped at the edge of a clearing. And that's where we first saw it. Not the creature, no, something it had done. It was like a crime scene plucked out of a nightmare. There was a crude structure in the center of the clearing a nest of sorts, woven from branches, mud, and things. Clothing, scraps of backpacks, a mangled hiking boot. Bow rose in my throat. This wasn't an animal leaving behind trophies. This was something calculating, something with a chilling intelligence. At the far end of the clearing was a cave opening, half concealed by tangled vines. It dragged them in there, Chuck whispered, his voice cracking. Mike pulled a high-powered flashlight from his pack and gestured for us to form up. Sarah reached for the rifle slung across her back the safety clicking off. I gripped my own firearm, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. We moved forward, flashlights cutting through the gloom. The cave entrance loomed closer, a gaping maw in the side of the hill. The stench emanating from it was almost overpowering, a mix of decay and something foul I couldn't place. I exchanged a look with Mike. This was it. We stepped inside, the darkness enveloping us. The ground was uneven, littered with bones, animal, I hoped. The beams of our flashlights danced over the walls, carving grotesque shadows out of the damp stone. Then it hit me. That smell, I recognized it. Iron. Blood. Eyes sharp. My kissed. We pressed deeper into the cave our movements slow, deliberate. That's when we heard it. A low growl that rumbled through the tunnel, reverberating in my chest. Something was ahead, and it knew we were here. Mike raised his fist, silently signaling us to halt. The growl intensified, followed by a scraping sound, like claws against rock. There, up ahead, a flicker of movement caught our flashlights. A pair of eyes glinted in the darkness, bright yellow, reflecting the light. It was massive. Easily eight feet tall when it reared up on its hind legs, its form skeletal, muscles taut and rippling beneath grayish, hairless skin. Its head was elongated, too many teeth crowded into a mouth that stretched far too wide. This was no bear, no mutated wolf. This was something else. Something old and unnatural. It lunged. Chaos erupted. Gunfire echoed through the confined space, flashes illuminating the creature's grotesquely distorted features. Sarah screamed, more enraged than terror, I think, as it swiped a massive clawed hand at her. The creature was fast, impossibly so for its size. It dodged our bullets, blurred shadows against the rock walls. 
The cave was too tight to maneuver. It had the advantage. Mike yelled something, but then the creature was on him, knocking him to the ground with a force that reverberated through the cave. Mike hit the cave wall hard, his gun flying from his grasp. I fired. Once, twice, aiming for the creature's head. It snarled, a spray of blood flying as one of my shots found its mark. The creature twisted, its attention now fully on me. It stalked towards me, its eyes burning, promising a gruesome death. Sarah was suddenly there, pulling Mike to his feet in one fluid motion. Cover fire! she yelled, her rifle spitting bullets at the creature, forcing it to dodge and weave. Mike stumbled over to where his gun had landed and grabbed it, regaining his footing. I took my chance, firing again trying to keep the creature back while Sarah and Mike scrambled to reposition themselves. Another shot struck, this time in the shoulder, eliciting a furious howl from the creature. But it wasn't enough. It lunged again, this time going for Sarah. She rolled desperately, the creature's claws tearing through her jacket, narrowly missing her flesh. Mike fired a burst, driving the creature back momentarily. Fall back, he shouted, his voice hoarse. I didn't need to be told twice. We retreated further into the tunnel, the creature's snarls fading behind us. We reached a fork in the cave, two dark passageways branching out. Split up! Sarah barked, already sprinting towards the left passage. It can't chase us both. Mike took a deep breath turning towards the right passage. Go! We'll meet back at the entrance. I hesitated, guilt and unease warring inside me, leaving Mike to face that thing alone. But he was right. We'd only be sitting ducks if we stayed together. With a final nod, I turned and ran, following Sarah's fading footsteps. The tunnel was a twisting, claustrophobic nightmare, the damp, earthy air felt heavy in my lungs as I pushed myself harder. Behind me, I heard a crash and a roar that echoed down the other passage. Mike had bought me some time. I owed it to him to not waste it. I burst out of the cave, blinking in the sudden sunlight. Where was Sarah? Before I could catch my breath, something slammed into me from the side, knocking me to the ground. It was the creature. I fought back, scrambling and kicking. Its claws raked across my arm, drawing hot lines of pain. The stink of its breath choked me as it snapped its elongated jaws inches from my face. I yelled, shoving with all my remaining strength. A gunshot echoed, and the creature jolted. A second shot, and it reared up, bellowing in pain. I rolled away and scrambled to my feet. Sarah stood at the tree lean, rifle steady, her face a mask of grim determination. The creature hesitated, then turned and bolted back into the cover of the cave. You okay? Sarah asked, rushing over to me. I managed a shaky nod, clutching my wounded arm. Mike Dash, I know, she said quietly. There's no point in going back in there now. We need to get out of here. It was a blur after that. A frantic hike back to the jeep, a choked-up call for backup on the satellite radio, an agonizing wait for extraction as darkness fell over the forest. And always the image of Mike, his eyes wide with terror as the creature closed in. They never found his remains— Whatever lair that creature had deeper in the caves, there was nothing left for them to recover. Just another name added to the missing persons list. The official report, sanitized and spun for public consumption, attributed the disappearances to an unknown animal attack. Sarah, myself, and the backup team that arrived, we all swore to secrecy. They gave us our commendations and shuffled us off to the next assignment. But we knew. 
We'd looked that thing in the eye, seen the hunger, the cunning intelligence in its gaze. This wasn't just some oversized beast. There was too much calculation in its savagery. In the years since, I'd been on a dozen other hunts, Sasquatch sightings in the Pacific Northwest, strange lights over remote desert valleys. But none of them compared to that cave in Oregon. It left a mark on me, a cold sense of dread I can't quite shake. You see, the government knows. Sure, they downplay it, compartmentalize it, but those in the inner circles know the truth. We aren't alone on this planet. There are things lurking in the shadows, older and hungrier than we can understand. They play by different rules, and more often than not, we're hopelessly outmatched. The locals call it the Shadow Walker, now, whispered tales around campfires. Another cryptid myth to fuel the legend. They don't know how close to the truth they are. It walks in the shadows because the light of civilization is the only place it can't follow not yet, anyway. After Oregon, Sarah left the unit. Couldn't handle it any more, she said. Don't blame her one bit. Sometimes I wonder if I should do the same, walk away while I'm still in one piece. Maybe find a nice, quiet desk job somewhere far from the backwoods. But then I think about those missing persons. The faces in the case files, the ones left behind with nothing but unanswered questions. And my, gone in a dark cave for a creature the world refuses to believe exists. No, I can't walk away. Someone has to stand at the edge of the darkness and watch for what crawls out of it. I don't know how long any of us can last, or what the cost will be in the end. But someone has to try. My name is Ben Cooper, and this happened to me back in 2012. I was still green back then, a fresh recruit for a branch of the government that most people believe is just a campfire tale. To this day, I still wish they were right. We call ourselves the Cryptid Investigations Unit, though we don't have patches or shiny badges. Our offices are unmarked, buried in the bowels of some government building nobody ever looks twice at. Most days, it's combing blurry photos, chasing down wild goose leads that turn out to be misidentified bears or attention-seeking hoaxers. Then, there are the other days. The days when what you think is myth claws its way into your world. This case took me to Wyoming. A string of strange occurrences in and around Yellowstone National Park. Sightings of a huge, shadowy beast, cattle mutilations with surgical precision, and a couple of hikers who were never heard from again. We were called in after two rangers vanished in almost identical circumstances. My partners in this were Nadia Ortiz and Travis Bell. Nadia was our veteran, a seasoned tracker with a no-nonsense attitude that could intimidate a grizzly. Bell was on the tech side, wiry and whip-smart, able to spin satellite data and thermal images into actionable intel. Me? I was there mostly for my muscle and the fact that the higher-ups figured a new guy needed some. Field experience! We settled into an isolated cabin near the park boundary, a base of operations for our investigation. Locals were spooked, and I admit, it was starting to get to me too. Wyoming has that effect the wide open spaces, the mountains so big they make you feel insects small. At night, the silence was so absolute, it started to play tricks on my mind. The first few days were a lot of nothing. We interviewed witnesses, most of them jumpy and shaken, a few with that glint in their eye that told me they were craving the spotlight. But then, then Nadia caught a break on the thermal cameras Bell had set up on a ridge. A heat signature. Too big to be a deer, too slow and steady to be a mountain lion. There was something out there. 
The morning we went out to track it was clear and crisp. You don't realize how good fresh air smells until you spend weeks breathing recycled air in government buildings. But even that couldn't erase the prickling unease that had been building since we arrived. This felt different. We found signs easily enough. Massive, clawed footprints pressed into the muddy earth, a tuft of coarse, black fur snagged on a thorn bush, and there was the smell. Like what dog left out in the sun, but with an underlying metallic tang that made my stomach churn. We tracked it up into a heavily wooded ravine. Bell tapped my shoulder, pointing to a set of broken branches high up on a tree trunk. Whatever we were following was massive, at least nine, ten feet at the shoulder, moving with practiced stealth. My grip tightened on my rifle. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Nadia had switched hers to armor-piercing rounds, just in case. We were way out of our league. The ravine wound upwards. The trees closed in around us, making the dappled sunlight feel sickly and dim. We were entering its territory now. Bell swore softly under his breath. His thermal scanner was pinging, and it was close. We moved single file, Nadia in the lead, me bringing up the rear. The tension ratcheted up to an almost unbearable level. This wasn't a hunt anymore. We were the prey. Suddenly Nadia stopped. I peered past her shoulder, my pulse a frantic drumbeat in my ears. Just ahead, a clearing. And in it, the creature. It stood half-concealed in the shadows, its form a silhouette against the light. I blinked, trying to process what I was seeing. It was bipedal, powerfully built. Muscle rippled beneath taut, pale skin that seemed almost translucent. The shoulders hunched, leading to a long neck and a head that... that wasn't quite right. Not animal, not entirely human. The only word my brain could conjure was... Wrong. Just as suddenly it was moving. Not charging, stalking. It circled us, slinking between the trees like a predator testing its quarry. The clearing might as well have been a cage. My mouth went dry. Nadia and Bell exchanged a look too quick for me to interpret. A low growl echoed through the ravine, almost a purr. I realized it was toying with us. Travis's voice crackled over the radio. Incoming! Get out of there! I barely registered his words before all hell broke loose. There was a blur of motion to our left, a second creature exploding out of the undergrowth. I fired on instinct, shots echoing through the ravine. It stumbled back, a spray of blood painting the leaves. Nadia and Bell opened fire as well. The response was instantaneous. The creature in the clearing lunged, a shriek tearing from its distorted mouth. Its speed, dear God. One second it was just a shadow, the next it was barreling toward Bell. He yelled, more in surprise than fear, and stumbled back his rifle flying from his hands. His thermal scanner clattered against the rock as the creature slammed into him, sending them both sprawling. We didn't hesitate. Nadia and I poured fire at the thing. It reared back, roaring, Bell's limp form dangling in its clawed fist like a doll. One of Nadia's shots must have hit something vital. Its grip loosened, and Bell slid to the ground. The creature faltered, then bolted back into the cover of the trees. I sprinted over to Bell, barely even seeing him over the pounding of my own heart. Nadia was right behind me, weapon trained on the tree lean. Bell! I dropped to my knees, trying to locate his injuries amidst the torn fabric and leaves. Nadia crouched on the opposite side, her expression grim. It punctured his lung she said, her voice tight. He needs a hospital now. With shaking hands, I ripped open my pack to grab the emergency radio beacon. 
Just hit the switch and a chopper would be inbound within the hour. But would it be fast enough? Bell coughed, blood bubbling at the corner of his mouth. He looked up at us, his eyes wide and filled with more fear than pain. Then his gaze flickered to something behind us. The clearing was empty. But the noises. I heard them now. Snapping branches, heavy footfalls circling us, getting closer, echoing off the rock walls of the ravine. We were surrounded. My hand was hovering over the beacon's activation switch. We couldn't stay here. Not injured, not outgunned against whatever was lurking in those trees. The creatures had to know we could call for help. Yet, there was a chilling hesitation. If we signaled for extraction, they'd swoop in, quarantine the area, and sanitize the entire incident. Bell would end up in some government hospital. Those creatures, if we were lucky enough to bring them down, would disappear into a lab somewhere, and the world would be none the wiser. It was our job to keep the balance. But a nagging voice in my head whispered, some balances were better left undisturbed. Coop, we gotta go. Nadia's voice cut through my inner conflict. She wasn't wrong. This was a fight we couldn't win not today. I looked down at Bell, his face pale and drawn. This was my call, my responsibility. Incoming! I shouted, flipping the beacon's cover and slamming down on the trigger. The signal blipped out into the ether, a silent plea for rescue. Now, all we had to do was survive until they got here. Scooping up Bell's rifle, I slung his arm over my shoulder. With Nadia helping to support his other side, we stumbled out of the clearing, back the way we came. If we were lucky, the creatures wouldn't want to risk exposure by giving chase with a helicopter potentially on the way. Then again, luck had abandoned us the second we stepped foot in those woods. The trek back was a blur of pain, fear, and adrenaline. Bell was fading fast, and the sounds of pursuit echoed behind us. Each snap of a twig made me jump, heart pounding. We had to make it to open ground, give the chopper a clear spot to land. Nadia swore, pointing ahead. The tree line was finally opening up, but something was moving along the edge. One of the creatures its pale form flashing in and out of the shadows. It was flanking us, cutting off our escape. Over there! I yelled, spotting a jumble of boulders further ahead. If we could reach them, get some cover. We shifted direction, forcing our way through the undergrowth towards the rocks. Nadia fired back over her shoulder, aiming more to drive the creature off than actually hit it. The responding roar gave me some hope that she was succeeding. My lungs burned and Bell was dead weight against me, but those rocks were getting closer. Just a little further, and we might, might stand a chance. And then the earth erupted beneath our feet. I don't remember the fall. Just a sickening lurch, the flash of the creature's face as it burst from the ground directly below us, and then darkness. I came to with my head throbbing and the world tilted. We tumbled into some kind of hidden pit. Nadia groaned nearby, and as my vision cleared I saw Bell crumpled in a heap, mercifully unconscious. I scrambled over to him, checking desperately for a pulse. Weak, but there. Thank God, I whispered, slumping back against the dirt wall. We were alive. For now. It took me a moment to process our surroundings. The pit was roughly circular, ten feet deep, the sides sheer and smooth. A sinkhole? An animal burrow? I didn't care. All that mattered was that the creature, wherever it was, couldn't reach us easily. Nadia staggered over, nursing a bleeding gash on her arm. Radio? I held up the smashed remains took a tumble. Her jaw set in a hard line. Great. 
so we're bleeding, stuck in a hole, and those things are probably waiting for us to climb out. Not exactly a five-star getaway, I agreed grimly. Yet a flicker of something like hope ignited. It was desperate, foolish, but hope nonetheless. The chopper would be on its way. They'd find the signal source, spot the pit. Unless the creature was smart enough to hide our bodies. Panic clawed at me. No, they'd have to send a search team. They'd find us. Eventually. We wait, I said to Nadia, trying to sound more confident than I felt. And we did. Hour after agonizing hour huddled together in that pit, listening to the rustling and growls from above, praying for the sound of helicopter blades. Bell drifted between consciousness and delirium, his breaths rattling and wet. The sun began its descent, casting long shadows. Our beacon had a limited battery life, and night was falling. If help didn't arrive soon, it came as darkness closed in. Not the reassuring whoop-whoop of a rescue chopper, but a shriek that split the air. One of the creatures, directly above the pit's edge, its silhouette stark against the twilight. It peered down at us, head cocking to the side like a grotesque bird of prey. My blood ran cold. They knew. Nadia was already moving, scrambling to reach Bell's dropped rifle. I fumbled for my own, hands shaking. The creature lunged down into the pit. Gunfire echoed in the confined space, deafening and blinding. The creature roared, a blast of its fetid breath washing over us. Nadia tumbled back, scrambling away as it landed, claws gouging furrows into the dirt. I fired wildly, trying to drive it back up, give her space. But the pit was too narrow, offered no escape. The creature was on her in an instant, a blur of claws and teeth. Nadia screamed, kicking desperately. I lunged forward, slamming the butt of my rifle into the creature's head. It snarled and spun, knocking me against the wall. Nadia scrambled to her feet, blood streaking her face. Climb! she yelled, firing again. The creature twisted in place, disoriented for a split second. It was enough. I hauled myself up, handholds appearing in the smooth dirt with an almost miraculous timing. Frantically, I reached down to Nadia, dragging her up just as the creature recovered its senses and surged forward. It snapped at our heels, Nadia slipping and crying out as its claws raked her leg. I pulled her the rest of the way, and we collapsed at the pit's edge, gasping. And then the earth gave way. I don't know if they calculated it, or if it was sheer chance. But as they did below, the unsupported lip of the pit crumbled, and tons of dirt came crashing down. For several heart-stopping moments, the world was a blur of dust and noise. When it cleared, the pit was gone, filled in as though it had never existed. And of the creature, no sign. Help arrived twenty minutes later, drawn by the sounds of gunfire. When I told them about the pit, the creature's bell, they exchanged skeptical glances. A search team scoured the area and found nothing. No sinkhole, no bodies, no evidence at all of our ordeal. Officially, Bell's death was attributed to complications from his injuries. The incident was quietly buried. Nadia, she quit. I heard rumors she moved out west somewhere remote, as far from Wyoming and its shadows as possible. Me? I stayed. Someone has to hold the line in the darkness. Most days, I believe in what we do. I believe there's a reason we stumble across these creatures, a reason why the world's veil sometimes thins to reveal the horrors on the other side, that we're meant to fight back. But some nights, lying awake in the quiet of my government-issue apartment, the doubt creeps in. I think about the pit, the creatures, and the way everything vanished so neatly. 
And I wonder, are we the hunters, or are we simply the hunted? My name is Ethan Wilde, and this happened to me on October 23, 1999. I still pinch myself sometimes. Did it really happen, or is it some nightmare my brain concocted? I worked as a field agent in a special unit, and let's just say our wildlife investigations involved beasts never seen on National Geographic. We were based just outside Carson City, Nevada a remote, quiet place. Just us, the tumbleweeds, and the occasional conspiracy theorist who stumbled onto the wrong dirt track. Our unit got a call. Rancher in northern Nevada, near the Oregon border. Livestock disappearing, half-eaten carcasses turning up, the works. It fit the pattern. My partner was Kira, a no-nonsense woman who kept her shotgun loaded and her jokes as dry as the desert. We flew up north in a battered old chopper. Beneath us, the land unfolded into sagebrush plains and desolate, rust-colored mountains. It looked like God got bored halfway through creation and just walked away. The ranch sprawled across a lonely valley. Sun-bleached buildings, dust swirling in the empty corral. It felt like the setting of a horror movie just needed the creepy music. The rancher, Dale, waited on the porch, worry lines etched on his leathery face. He had the weather-beaten look of a man who spent more time arguing with nature than people. Turns out, this wasn't his first rodeo. He lost sheep a few years back, just vanished into thin air. This time it was worse— Two prized bulls gone and his best herding dog, torn up so bad he could barely look at it. His voice shook when he told us about it. This was more than livestock. It was his livelihood. I felt a pang of sympathy. It's tough out here. Kira and I got to work. No tracks that we could find. Nothing out of the ordinary. At least at first glance. We spent the day methodically combing the area, checked the fences, looked for any sign of struggle, anything. You wouldn't think it, but there's an art to tracking the untrackable. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we were about ready to call it a night. Then Kira held up a hand, her eyes narrowed. I followed her gaze a flicker of movement up on the ridge. Something dark, slinking against the fading light. We got ourselves a visitor, Kiara muttered. We grabbed our rifles and headed up the slope, the adrenaline starting to surge in my veins. The wind whipped at our faces as we crested the ridge. Below, a small, shallow cave yawned open. And there, silhouetted against the twilight, was our culprit. Not an animal, that's for sure. Too tall, too lean. It crouched on all fours, but somehow retained an unsettling kind of humanness. Naked, its skin stretched taut over wiry muscles, pale as moonlight. The head, there's no describing that head. Bulging, with eyes like black marbles and a maw that stretched too wide, bristling with needle-like teeth. Kira swore, and I just gaped like an idiot. This thing was straight out of my nightmares. Years of training, facing down things that shouldn't exist, and it still felt like a sucker punch to the gut. Then it moved. Blisteringly fast, a blur of bone-white flesh and claws. It lunged for Kira, who barely had time to bring her rifle up. The shot echoed in the still air, and the creature snarled, a high-pitched, chilling sound that set my teeth on edge. I snapped out of my stupor and fired, scattering it back into the shadows. Kira, you okay? Shaken, but in one piece, she gritted out. The thing had raked its claws down her arm, leaving long, angry gashes. We gotta get out of here, I said, my voice tight. 
Call for backup now. Kira hit the radio, barking coordinates into the mic. Then she tossed me a bandage. We huddled behind a rock, the creature circling just out of sight, its guttural snarl echoing in the night. My hands shook as I reloaded. This wasn't some predator from the wild. This was intelligent, malicious, and it was hunting us. Backup was at least an hour out, and I knew we weren't going to last that long. The creature tested us again, a flash of white in the moonlight. We fired, more to scare it than anything else. I could feel panic clawing at my throat. There's a difference between facing the unknown and facing the unimaginable. Suddenly, a new sound filled the air. The whirring of helicopter blades. Headlights cut through the darkness, and for a moment, hope flared then died just as quickly. The whirring stuttered, sputtered, and a horrible, choking sound filled the air. Then one light winked out, followed by the other. The chopper spiraled down, crashing into the foothills with a fiery explosion. Kira cursed a long, low string of words I'd never heard before. The creature shrieked in triumph. We were alone, truly alone. We gotta move, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Split up, try to make it back to the ranch. Kira gave me a grim nod. We sprinted off in opposite directions, the creature's hungry growl propelling us forward. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves, felt like its claws on my back. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt like they were about to give out. The ranch came into view, a beacon in the desolate landscape. But relief was short-lived. Dale stood on the porch, shotgun cradled in his arms his face etched with terror. It hit me with a chilling certainty. It wanted us all trapped. I skidded to a halt, gasping for breath. Dale! Get inside! Lock yourself in! I didn't wait to see if he obeyed. Kira was out there, alone and hurt, maybe running right into that thing's trap. I had to find her. I plunged back into the darkness following a hunch more than any rational plan. The creature was smart, almost diabolically so. It knew we'd make for higher ground, back towards the chopper crash where help might still arrive. Which meant Kira was probably heading that way, too. The shadows were alive, every rock and bush taking on a monstrous shape in my panic-fueled imagination. The creature's screeches echoed sporadically, drawing closer, then fading away, playing a twisted game of cat and mouse. Then I heard it, Kira's voice, a strange shout cut short by a gut-wrenching snarl. My blood ran cold. I sprinted towards the sound, rifle held high. The scene that met my eyes was the stuff of nightmares. Kira lay pinned beneath a fallen boulder, the wreckage of the helicopter smoldering nearby. The creature crouched beside her, its skeletal form a grotesque silhouette against the flames. One of Kira's legs was twisted at an unnatural angle, her face white with agony. Rage tore through me, a primal scream rising in my throat. I fired shot after shot, driving the creature back. It hissed, its black eyes gleaming with malevolent intelligence, then darted into the night. I rushed to Kira, my hands fumbling with a medkit. Her breathing was ragged, her eyes fixed on me in a mix of fear and relief. It, it got me, she rasped, her voice barely a whisper. Her leg was a mangled mess, bone protruding through flesh. We'll get you out of here, I lied, my voice shaking. There was no way. She knew it, too. Her eyes, always so sharp, held a resignation that cut deeper than any wound that beast had inflicted. There was a radio in the chopper wreckage. Maybe I could get a signal out, call for another team, but the rational part of my brain knew it was a pipe dream. 
This far out, we were as good as dead. Kira reached out, her hands surprisingly steady on mine. Ethan, it'll be back. Finish it. The words hung heavy between us. An impossible request, yet in those bleak, desperate moments, it felt like the only right thing to do. Tell, tell my folks I died fighting something good. She coughed, a fleck of blood staining her lips. I nodded, unable to speak. My heart was pounding, a mix of grief, fear, and a burning resolve. Kira squeezed my hand, then her grip slackened, her eyes staring vacantly past me. I laid her down gently, fighting back the tears. She deserved a proper burial, a hero's send-off, not to become some monstrous creature's meal. But time wasn't on my side. I gathered her up carefully. It was agonizing, seeing her like this. We'd faced so much together, shared jokes and near-death experiences. And now, I was carting her lifeless body like a sack of broken promises. The cave where we'd first encountered the creature was my grim destination. It felt wrong, desecrating her rest with that place, but it was the safest way to buy myself time. I laid her down as gently as I could, then barricaded the entrance with rocks, working with a maddening frenzy fueled by despair. Then came the hardest part, to become the bait. I found a high point near the cave. Not to hide, but to be the most obvious target. My rifle rested across my lap, and beside it, Kira's shotgun, loaded with extra shells. The moon was a cold, indifferent spectator to the scene. The waiting was almost worse than the fighting. Every rustle of wind, every snap of a twig, had my nerves screaming. The creature was playing with me, I knew it. Drawing out the hunt, savoring the terror. Then, that screech pierced the silence. It was close, circling me. I peered into the darkness, my finger tightening on the trigger. A shape flickered at the periphery of my vision, inhumanly fast. I fired, a desperate shout that echoed in the stillness. A roar of fury answered back. It was wounded, pissed, and coming straight for me. I braced myself, the hunter now the hunted. The creature lunged from the shadows. A blur of claws and teeth. I fired again and again, the recoil jarring my shoulder. It snarled, fell back, then charged again. Each shot seemed to merely enrage it further. I was running out of ammo and time. My vision blurred, a mix of sweat and tears. Then, a weight slammed into me, knocking the rifle from my hands. The creature was on me, its stench overpowering, its teeth gnashing inches from my face. I fumbled for Kira's shotgun, managed a single shot at point-blank range. The blast slammed the creature back. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm. The creature lay on its side, its breaths rattling, its inhuman eyes locked on me. It wasn't dead, but it was dying. For a moment, I just stared, a strange numbness washing over me. Then, the sound of sirens cut through the night. Red and blue lights flashed across the hills. Another team must have stumbled onto the crash and found our radio signal. They were too late for Kira, but maybe, just maybe, they weren't too late for me. The creature's body was never recovered. Officially, the incident was listed as a freak helicopter accident, wildlife attack, the cover story they always use. Me? I got patched up, physically at least. The scars run deeper than any beast's claws could. They gave us medals, offered counseling. Means nothing. Kiera's gone. Dale, too. After seeing that thing, he went mad with grief. They say he wandered off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. I tried going back to a normal life. Didn't work. 
Every shadow holds a monster now. I see that creature's eyes in my sleep, hear it snarl in every stray noise. I exist, but I can't say I'm living. The unit, they replaced Kiara, patched up the gaps like nothing happened. Business as usual. Maybe that's the biggest tragedy of all. The world keeps spinning, even when yours has shattered. Those things are still out there, I know it. And somewhere, some other poor bastard is staring down the same nightmare, unaware that their world is about to end.